Council and administration and members of the public uh, to our uh, February 7th Governance and Priorities meeting. Uh, I'll just start by letting everybody know that uh, the mayor is tuning in virtually, but just so that we uh, run a nice smooth meeting, uh, I'll be chairing this evening. Um, so there's that. Also, we'll be uh, doing a show of hands for votes in chambers, and we'll call on our virtual councillors for a voice vote when the time comes. Okay, with that, uh, I call this meeting to order, and if I can get uh, Councillor Pilechko uh, for a motion on the agenda. Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. The Town Council will adopt the February 7th, 2022 Governance and Priorities Meeting Agenda as presented. Uh, all in favor? In, uh, and uh, Mayor Choi? In favor. And Councillor Laurie? In favor. Thank you. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, we move on to number three, public input sessions, which we do not have any this evening. And moving on to number 4.1, uh, presentations and delegations. We have members from the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board this evening. Um, they will also be joining us uh, virtually, I believe. And uh, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to join you this evening. I'm sorry that uh, we weren't able to be there in person. My name is Karen Wichek and I'm the CEO of the EMRB. And I'm joined today by Cindy LeBlanc, who's the Director of Corporate and Stakeholder Relations. I wanted to start off by uh, just letting you know that our presentation today will provide you with a bit of an overview of the EMRB, our mandate, and the value of this very important table. We're delivering the same presentation to all of our member municipalities as a way to level set. And uh, for your information, you are the 12th of 13 member municipalities. And, and I'm really sorry to say that we, we aren't there in person prior to Christmas. We were attending all of the council meetings in person. And so I hope to uh, have the opportunity to come back and meet with all of you in person sometime soon. So I'm going to start off with really talking about who is the EMRB. Membership in the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board is mandatory and determined by those municipalities with five with populations of 5,000 or more. Our 13 member municipalities are a diverse group of six cities, four counties and three towns. With nearly 9,500 square kilometres in the heart of Alberta, our region accounts for one third of the province's population with close to 1.3 million citizens and 750,000 jobs. Our area is the second youngest and second fastest growing metropolitan region in Canada, making regional planning essential. And the EMRB has one shared vision. But how did we get to this shared vision? The region as a whole and sub-regionally has a long history of intermunicipal collaboration, whether it be voluntary or mandatory bodies like ACRA, the Edmonton Global, the Tri-Region and the Industrial Heartland. And the outcomes have resulted in major infrastructure like the Anthony Henday. In the late 1940s, we started seeing massive growth caused by the oil boom and a sense of urgency emerged around the need to plan regionally. This resulted in the first Edmonton District Planning Commission whose membership was voluntary. In 1956, the McNally Commission concluded that the piecemeal of development surrounding both Edmonton and Calgary was inappropriate and recommended mandatory metropolitan planning. This leads the province to mandate for the first time that municipalities work together to develop a regional plan. Legislation was amended in 1963 to make the Edmonton Region Planning Commission a mandatory regional planning body, and that territory actually extended all the way out to the Yellowhead area. By the 1980s, the Planning Commission is restructured to focus more on the Edmonton Metro Region and it adopts the first regional plan. And then fast forward 15 years. In the mid-1990s, a combination of the provincial government's political philosophy of the day, the economic downturn and tensions among members at the regional planning commissions led the government of Alberta to dissolve the planning commissions and devolve all planning authority back to member municipalities. Between 1995 and 2010, the region experienced a gap in planning policy, while at the same time continued to face tremendous growth 
and increased tensions between the municipalities. And in speaking with members of the development community at that time, it was chaos for them. They noted a time of, of incredible lack of certainty. And yet, despite this, former members of the Edmonton Metro Planning Commission formed a new voluntary body of intermunicipal planning agency called the Capital Region Forum, which in 1997 became the Alberta Capital Region Alliance or ACRA. At the start of the new century, we see two really important reports commissioned by the province. The first was the Heinemann Report in 2000 and the second, the Radke Report in 2007. Both of these reports concluded that strengthening the region was not a choice, but in fact, it was a necessity. This prompts Premier Stalmach in 2008 to establish the Capital Region Board to develop a long-term integrated growth management plan and 24 municipalities at the time made up the Capital Region Board and its membership was mandatory. In late 2016, the Capital Region Board approved and delivered upon its updated regional growth plan. And in 2017, while approving that plan, the Government of Alberta also looked at the structure of the board and reduced the number of members from 24 to 13, rebranding it to the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board or the EMRB as you know it today. If our history tells us anything, it is that by working together, we are better positioned to seize opportunities and address the challenges of a growing and integrated region. The concept of municipal growth management boards is well understood to be an effective way to position regions like ours, where multiple municipalities are, made, are in proximity to a major urban centre. The MRB is two, one of two provincially mandated regional growth management boards in Alberta. There are effective regional growth management boards throughout Canada, including in Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg and Vancouver. And up on the slide, you can see exactly what it is that that growth management boards do, providing a blueprint and a policy framework that helps create the conditions for cost efficient growth that match, maximizes economic opportunity and includes and improves quality of life through developing growth and servicing plans developing coordinating policy for regional infrastructure investment and service delivery, ensuring efficient use of land, including environmentally responsible land use planning, providing certainty to investors and developers, and providing sustainable and econo pro promoting sustainable and economic well-being and competitiveness throughout the region. Enabling responsible growth means creating the conditions to maximize cost efficient growth and develop and implement policies for cost sharing, economic development and, and investment, improving quality of life for our residents, planning and building for future generations, and really importantly, fostering dynamic regional conversations that lead to new opportunities and the ability to solve problems together. The board, the board and mandate are enabled by provincial regulation under the MGA. In, under that legislative mandate includes promoting long-term sustainability for the region, ensuring environmentally responsible land use planning, growth management and efficient uses of land, developing policies regarding the coordination of regional infrastructure investment and service delivery, promoting the economic well-being and competitiveness of the region, and developing policies for how the board will engage the, pu the public. With respect to our decision making, we strive for a consensus based decision making process that's, that is based on understanding and respecting municipal perspectives, developing a shared value proposition and outcomes, evidence based and data driven decision making, establishing task forces and working groups of municipal experts, and enlisting subject matter experts from outside that have an interest in helping the region grow. Decisions, for the most part, do not come to the board on a whim. Ideas and initiatives are traditionally sent to committees or task forces for further consideration before any decision is made. It is through these committees, task forces and working groups where different perspectives are shared and where we get a better systems view of the matter at hand. Through this deliberative process, our members have an opportunity to share their local realities and influence the work and refine the ideas in a way that benefits all member municipalities. But as with anything, there is still room for improvement for our members to better understand one another, and that will be one of the board's core focuses as we move through this first term of the board, or this first year of the board. That said, while we strive for consensus, all decisions ultimately require a vote of the board. 
For a, member, for a motion to pass at the board, it requires the support of two thirds members representing two thirds of the population. With respect to our specific mandated duties, in fulfilling the mandate, the board shall prepare a growth plan, a servicing plan, advise and make recommendations to the minister regarding both, facilitate the resolutions of, of issues and prep, from preparation that arises from both, and develop and implement policies for cost sharing for regional projects throughout the region. While members are appointed by virtue of their election to their respective municipal councils, when they come together around the EMRB table, they are first and foremost working in to serve the best interests of the region. As a distinct and legal entity, the EMRB should not be viewed as another order of government or as an extension of each municipality, but rather as a regional body with a regional focus. A board member is not precluded from taking into account their municipality's best interests or making a decision that advances um, their municipality, so long as the municipality's best interests are not the exclusive <laughs> consideration and the action is also consistent with the best interests of the region. The EMRB truly deserves the best efforts of all to make it work. Consistent with the, with the vision of the board to be highly strategic and engaged, the roles and the responsibilities of each board member include instilling a strategic focus and inspiring a compelling vision, fostering effective interper, per, interpersonal relationships with colleagues, actively participating in board debate and discussion, demonstrating a working knowledge of the EMRB, keeping up to date and informed on, of issues and trends that may influence the region, reporting on activities and decisions of the board back to respective municipal councils and representing the board at different functions. EMRB's annual budget is approximately $3.4 million. The funding comes from both provincial government grants and from member municipalities. Member municipality contributions are determined on an equitable proportion based formula and for the town of Stony Plain, it is slightly over a about $34,000 a year. Growth is about using our land wisely to protect our quality of life and enhance prosperity for future generations. The EMRB's value to the region comes through focusing on issues that are regionally significant, climate change and protecting the environment, including air, water and biodiversity, municipal services, including public safety, infrastructure, transportation choices and solid waste, agriculture, including stewarding the land, ensuring local food supply and food security, and an economic development and broadband. The EMRB works to create the conditions that set the stage for prosperity by enhancing investment readiness and setting the stage for economic development, creating investor certainty through clear and consistent regulatory and policy frameworks, and by creating operational efficiencies through reducing duplication within the region, providing one window access to the region and leveraging economies of scale and shared resources. The growth plan is a future focused 30 year plan for the region representing our collective commitment to working together and growing responsibly to accommodate a projected 1 million additional res residents and an increase in 475,000 jobs. And when I think about that, I like to pause for a minute and actually think about the enormity of that task. When you think about how long it has taken until now for us to grow to 1.3 million people, we will add another million people in about a quarter of that time. That's an extraordinary amount of planning that needs to be done for us to think about how do we accommodate the um, solid waste of another million people? How do we move those goods and services and, and um, and make sure that people can get to their places of employment with another million people in the region. And of course, we know that they won't all choose to live and work in the same place. The growth plan provides a comprehensive and integrated policy framework for managing growth. It's not a one size fits all approach, but applies the same principles and strategies and objectives in a contextually sensitive manner. The growth plan is a holistic plan and includes six interconnected policy areas economic competitiveness and employment, natural living systems, communities and housing, integration of land and infrastructure, transportation systems and agriculture. Some of the quantifiable benefits are shown of the plan are shown on this slide. 
The Metropolitan Region Servicing Plan supports the implementation of the growth plan by focusing on areas where we can realize efficiencies in planning for regionally significant services, identifying and prioritizing regional infrastructure investments, and identifying opportunities to coordinate delivery of services. The work of the MRSP recognizes the fiscal realities facing us all in that the costs associated with providing infrastructure and efficient, and efficient services now and for those additional 1 million people and associated 475,000 jobs will be greater than any one of our municipalities can manage alone. It also recognizes that leveraging economies of scale and identifying opportunities to work together will benefit taxpayers across all of our municipalities. The board has chosen to focus on the four priority service areas that you see on the screen. The priority service areas were carefully chosen from a much broader list and were determined to be areas where the EMRB could have the most impact. The Integrated Regional Transportation Master Plan, or IRTMP, lays the groundwork for how we integrate and achieve greater efficiencies across our regional transportation network. The process undertaken to develop the plan was evidence-based and optimizes regional networks, reduces duplication in transportation planning, and prioritizes investment in critical transportation infrastructure. Alberta Transportation was a member of the IRTMP task force and by working side by side on this new 25 year plan for the region, we were able to look beyond just roads. We looked at multimodal forms of transportation and the transportation infrastructure hubs needed to better move goods and services and people. Because of this intergovernmental collaboration, Alberta Transportation has advised that they are using the IRTMP as a foundation to build out the next 50 year plan for the region. With respect to our Regional Agriculture Master Plan, or RAMP, RAMP is a core piece of work to complete the growth plan and is awaiting approval by the province. Agriculture is recognized as Alberta's second largest economic generator. It is expected to lead our province's economic recovery and will contribute immensely to GDP growth. RAMP is the first ever regional plan to manage land use for the future of agriculture and the agriculture sector by ensuring producers and processors have room to grow. RAMP also included the development of a land evaluation and site assessment tool for our region, a first such analysis to be completed on the, on the prairies. LISA is the tool that ensures we have a rigorous process based on a consistent approach to identify areas of prime agricultural lands. RAMP is about conserving those prime agricultural lands and creating opportunities for value-added agriculture to expand. As a part of the economic imperative study that we commissioned, we learned there is an incredible potential to create jobs and increase the region's economic prosperity by an estimated $10 billion, supporting vibrant communities and economies. I'd also like to talk to you about the Shared Investment for Shared Benefit Framework. SISB is an investment evaluation framework and model for quantifying and qualifying regionally significant invest in investment opportunities through the sharing of costs, which may include resources, land, data, and expertise among, among other assets, and of course, sharing benefits. The SISB supports the work of the board by enhancing the economic competitiveness of the region and providing opportunities to increase and enhance regional collaboration that could include other orders of government, regional stakeholders, and private investors. In 2019-20, the board also undertook a comprehensive environmental scan of the state of broadband in the region. Investing in critical infrastructure in the form of high-speed internet is essential to ensure our region is recognized as globally economically competitive to attract investment, businesses and talent, and is critical to ensuring a high quality of life and equal opportunity to all our residents. And of course, we've all been through this pandemic and I don't have to tell you how important it is for business, education, health and so many other things, just keeping us connected day to day. The report identified issues of accessibility and connectivity throughout the region and builds the case for addressing the gap as a priority. The report highlighted broadband as an essential service and quantified the economic benefit associated with addressing critical gaps regardless of where residents live and work in the region. 
The report has taught us, has caught the attention of national and international private investors because of the data that we were able to uh, consolidate. Regional data is a tremendous asset that can and should be better, better leveraged. And I hope that we do that going forward. Of course, our priorities aren't static, and these have changed over time as directed by the board. If the last four years were focused on transportation, agriculture, shared investment for shared benefit and broadband, the board has previously tackled other issues, including housing diversity. In 2013, the board released the Our Affordable Future report and looked at housing choices across the region to better understand the demand and supply gap. It found that housing choices were somewhat limited and do not address the diversity of housing needed today and in the future and proposed a number of plans and frameworks. Based on the discussions prior to, e prior to ESG, this may be one of the things, um, sorry, based on the discussions prior to the new board and the focus on ESG, this may be one of the things that does come forward with the new board. The Regional Evaluation Framework, or REF, is the board's mechanism to ensure municipal planning is consistent with the growth plan. The growth plan recognizes member municipalities are unique and have different planning frameworks and policies to implement the growth plan at a local level. The REF takes into account considera into consideration the uniqueness of each municipality and allows flexibility in how members approach implementation while ensuring municipal statutory planning adequately aligns with the principles and policies of the growth plan. The existence of the REF provides greater certainty for municipalities and for the development community. The Regional Geographic Information Services, or Emerges, was first approved by the board in 2009 and enables, and enables improved collection, maintenance, and sharing of regionally significant data between member municipalities. It supports regional decision making and aims to expand regional capacity to deliver geographically based information and services that, su that support sustainable land use, public transit and housing decisions through collaboration of the board and its member municipalities. When the region's new growth plan was approved, it included 26 unique key performance indicators or KPIs to keep our growth on track and ensure our regional planning is responsive to our changing realities. These KPIs are aligned to the outcomes of the growth plan and the six policy areas. The majority of the KPIs rely on the data on data from the federal census. We will be assessing these KPIs as a part of the five year interim review of the growth plan, which will be taking undertaking un over the next two years. The AMRB is a place where many regional ideas are born and can be discussed. And I know that later today you're going to hear from both Edmonton Global and uh, the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Transit Com Commission. It's great to be able to have uh, colleagues across the region that are working to advance the region. And I can tell you that we spend uh, a significant amount of time talking to one another. As you will have seen throughout the presentation, and I hope you understand, our work is truly, truly legacy work. Last year, the board approved its 2021 to 24 strategic plan called a region by design. This plan sets a new foundation and framework for determining our strategic direction and focuses on key, three key priority areas. The first is enabling responsible growth across the region. We have committed to developing and implementing a whole, holistic growth and servicing plans to achieve the 50 year vision that will attract and retain investment and talent, ensure sustainability, enhance efficiencies, seed economic development, and elevate the quality of life for citizens across the region. Committing to ESG practices and, po and policies is priority number two. We have taken the very intentional step to embed an environmental, to embed an environmental, social, and governance lens in the plans, policies, and practices guiding the work of the board to meet the tri triple bottom line and ensure sustainable communities for future generations. And the third priority is to collaborate to enhance outcomes across the region. We seek to focus on opportunities that will leverage economies of scale, find efficiencies, and enable member municipalities to work smarter together. And of course, to engage key regional partners and traditional and non-traditional stakeholders in our work. So what does this mean? And why would the board approve a new strategic plan at the end of its term? 
What we've realized is that strategic plans aren't one and done every four years. They don't just sit on a shelf, but rather they are plans that are evergreened and come forward annually. The previous board was cautious and laid out a foundation for our ongoing work. It is up to the incoming board, the board that is just that has uh, been in place since November, to identify what it will want to focus on and set the agenda for uh, the next four years. If there's really anything that I can leave you with today, it's that I would like to say to you that the magnitude of the work of this board is awesome. Not awesome in terms of, hey, that's fantastic, but really, truly, that there's no one else who has the responsibility and accountability for planning for this region over the next 30, 40, and 50 years. We deal with the biggest of the big um, um, initiatives, whether it's transportation infrastructure, whether it's servicing, whether it's how we protect our prime agricultural lands, whether it's how we seed um, the success, the, the conditions of success for, for investment and for greater quality of life. It's a real privilege for me to lead the team at the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board, and I'd be happy to take your questions and also, um, for sure, uh, ask Mayor Choi if there's anything that he would like to add. Thank you, Karen. And, uh, and uh, with, uh, with that, we'll that open it for, uh, for uh, questions from Council, questions from council? to our presentation. Our oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mayor Choi, uh, Mayor if Choi, you have anything, you have anything to add? I think you do, Deputy Mayor. I have nothing to add. I think um, our CEO, our CEO, Karen Wechek, did a good job of um, kind of showcasing the overall concept of the RMB and what we've been doing over the last uh, one year as the RMB and the last 10 years as the CRB. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Choi. Uh, now I'll open it uh, to questions from Council. And uh, Councillor Laurie, I can't see you, so if you have a question, feel free to jump in. I'm good, thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Mayor Choi. Oh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'm just wondering if our CEO can provide some uh, kind of a little highlight of the broadband strategy that the EMB is, has been working on. As we know, for the last uh, two years during this global pandemic, um, high speed reliable internet is not a, just a necessity, like it's not a, a nice to have anymore, it's a necessity. And uh, I think. The board at the EMRB has been focused on trying to get uh, broadband that's throughout the entire region. Sure, thank you for that question, Mayor Choi. After our, our the initial work was done, uh, one of the things that we did was partner with both Edmonton Global and the Greater Edmonton Region Chamber of Commerce to talk about how can we elevate the work that still needs to be done around attracting investment to this region to advance um, further, whether it is um, fiber going into the ground or whether it is broadband to the last mile to the last home in the region. Um, you know, one of the things that was highlighted in our report is that we do not speak with one voice in this region. And in fact, we talk about the same issue, but we use different language and we talk about it quite differently. And so what we have been focused on is joint submissions to both the provincial and uh, federal government, as well as the sharing of the data that we um, accumulated while we were doing the work. What we didn't realize, I think, when we did our regional, uh, when we did the scan, the environmental scan throughout the member municipalities, was the power of that data and how collecting that data in one place would really attract the attention of both national and international investors. And so we have had um, ongoing meetings with different investors, and in particular, the last one was actually with Rogers, who, who brought their executive team here from different places across the country, Toronto, Calgary, Vancouver, to talk about uh, what an investment in this region might look like. And, you know, I have to, my hat goes off to Malcolm Bruce, who you're going to hear from later today. We worked closely together to plan an agenda uh, for that day. And I think what was most surprising to us was how 
surprised Rogers was, was that we had all that data for them in one place. Makes decision making really, really easy for investors when we have um, taken that data from across the region and built it into a form that is usu- that is usable. So we continue to track that. The other thing that I think is important that we've been working on is that broadband is not, it's identified in the growth plan uh, as as um, an area of um, as an area of importance, but it was done at the board as a as a report. And one of the things that we have talked to Edmonton Global and the Greater Edmonton Region Chambers of Commerce about is the fact that this is now this digital infrastructure is essential infrastructure. And what I've proposed at the board recently is that it fall under the Metropolitan Region Servicing Plan so we don't lose sight of it. And it's something that um, is a board initiative going forward and not just something that we're doing off the sides of our desks. So I hope, Mayor Choi, that gives you a, a good sense of how we've progressed with that initiative. Is that a good answer, uh, Mayor Choi? Uh, yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Deputy Mayor. Councillor Hansard. May I, may I make a comment? And you, there may, may be a question do. buried in there as well. I really appreciate the presentation that you brought to us this evening. And uh, having been on council before and then stepping back on council now, I'm actually quite impressed with the work that has been done. Um, and I know in your time frame, the timeline you put up there, it grabbed a number of years when I previously sat on council. But I think we have a tendency to be too close to it or not close enough, and we don't really appreciate it. But to have you capture it in a review is very, very good. One of the concerns that I had from the very beginning uh, was if the municipalities around uh, Edmonton were just going to be small players in Edmonton's success, or if all the success that was brought to Edmonton would be shared among all the municipalities. So far, I'm getting a sense that, that it is shared, that uh, everybody at the table is viewed as important, the voices matter, the people in the communities matter, and that this is just a way to capture um, the world's attention, so to speak, and focus it on the Edmonton region. I hope in a like manner that the communities that lie outside of these initial uh, 13 or so communities here will also realize that they stand to gain and that in a very real way, the, the Metropolitan Region Board also is advocating on their behalf. When something good happens in the area, it's good for everybody. And so I'm just wondering if, if your presentations have been centering about these communities and you sharing with them and, and, and us and saying that we're number 12 of 13, is there a plan to take this message in some way to the outlying regions so that they also feel that this is of benefit. When, when, when it's good for one, it's good for all. And I'd certainly like that uh, sense of, of um, benefit to be felt by outlying areas. Is it, have you guys thought about that or is that something that is somewhere on your radar? If I can um, attempt to answer that, I think the first thing I'd like to say is thank you for the observations that you share, um, having stepped away and then back at the table, because we are close to it. And I think sometimes we wonder, um, you know, is progress being made? And, And of course, you know, I sit back and think about the last three and a half years that I've been here and um, really, really proud of the effort of this board. They've, they, so many great things 
came across the finish line in the last three years. And I think that, you know, your comments around the inclusiveness and how the board engages, I have to tell you that I sat in a, a technical working group meeting today, which is made up of all 13 member municipalities, it's subject matter experts working on a particular issue that, that we're tackling. And, you know, the respect around the table for everyone, uh, regardless of the member municipality that they come from is immense. And I think that's also shown at the board table by our board members who are really, really working on listening to one another. And in fact, on May 13th, you will have been re-invited. We had to cancel it in January to um, a uh, event that's being held in Mournville. And the first part of that morning, that day long session, we'll talk about those member municipalities and really trying to understand one another and what we gain from each other. Um, with respect to your question uh, related specifically to uh, member municipalities that are outside of the 13, I think it really, in part, how we engage them and when we engage them depends. And so, for example, when we were doing the work on broadband, we did engage them and brought them to the table as stakeholders because it was important to understand uh, what we could about uh, not only them as member municipalities, but how secondary institutions and school boards in the region and such. With respect to um, the kind of engagement that we do with the rest of the work that we're talking about, I think really that is a part of uh, a much more aggressive communication strategy that uh, the board is really undertaking. Have we identified them specifically as a um, as a stakeholder uh, in all of our communications efforts? No, we have not. For sure, we have not. But it certainly is something for us to think about because, as we know, uh, at one point in time, most of those member municipalities that you're referring to had a seat at this table. And so how we uh, move forward and keep them engaged um, is certainly part of that communication strategy, but I would also say comes up for discussion every now and then when we are talking about things like the five year interim review of the growth plan. We always have to think about um, who sits at our table and who can compel who can compel who to participate. But, um, you know, your point is a very good one and I think it's up to us um, as a board and as an administration to think about um, that communication strategy, which I, which as I said, is becoming far more aggressive over the past year and a half. Good. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, uh, and thank you for your uh, presentation. As a, a new face uh, on Council, I'm always excited to see the amount of collaboration that uh, goes on. Um, you know, not just in our tri-region, but the greater Edmonton region. Um, and you've laid out some um, fantastic points and benefits and uh, certainly work that we want to continue long into the future um, and grow in both quality and quantity. Uh, the question that I have today uh, just relates to some of the numbers that were uh, presented um, with this year's budget of 3.4 million, um, next year shifting to a ratio of two to one with municipalities picking up um, the greater share, you know, with uh, inflation and all of these cost increases, how do we um, as EMRB make sure that this work is sustainable um, and that the cost of it doesn't uh, overwhelm some of our smaller municipalities? So I think um, a couple of things, and that's a great question, and it certainly has been and is on the minds of both the board members and uh, and the administration. So the first thing that I would say is that um, we are moving forward with uh, an advocacy strategy that would ask for that um, budget of two million on the grant to be reinstated, and and really how how we're doing that and and what we're bringing forward is just the just the amount of work that emrb is now doing and how you have to evergreen that work and we can't allow uh, ourselves to backslide on the progress that we've made knowing that there are so many much more important pieces that we also have to bring to this puzzle thinking about climate change thinking about engagement with our indigenous communities thinking about um broader engagement um, with other member municipalities in the region in communications, 
do we want to tackle housing going forward? And then how do we maintain the work uh, that so many have, you know, put um, effort into over the past four years? So I think that's that's one thing. There's that there's that advocacy piece. The second is really about looking at who are the other strategic partners, um, both in the region, but other orders of government that benefit from this work. And so there are certainly partners that find um, and receive benefit from the work that we do and um, and certainly are interested in helping create the conditions for success and quality of life. And so it's those kind of traditional and non-traditional partners that we're looking for that may co-fund some of the work because it's also of interest to them and they'll benefit from the data and the outcomes that we have. And so that's another um, that's another opportunity that I think that we need to think about. In, at our Committee of the Whole meeting in March, we're actually going to spend time as a board, uh, outside of a board meeting, but more in a discussion format to talk about sustainability of the region and of the regional efforts and what does that mean for EMRB? Because certainly if we are unable to uh, sustain our budget, that does mean that we're going to have to make some tough choices and we're gonna have to set some priorities and think about um, the outcomes uh, of the work. But I would say to you that you know, leveraging the economies of scale, sharing data and best practices, really working together to solve regional problems is so worth that investment. And um, and I and I think that, you know, part of it is making that case to do so and uh, and making sure that uh, we're able to address any future budget shortfalls that we may have. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for your response. Lots of uh Great things there. It shows that uh, it's certainly on the mind in terms of the sustainability piece of this. Um, and that gives me a lot of confidence. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Uh, any other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you, Karen. Uh, I think uh, I think that comes to the end of your presentation. Uh, I would like to say... Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor. Yes, Mayor Choi. Thank you. Before we uh, let uh, CEO Karen Wiecek uh, go, I'd just like to her to just kind of talk about uh, the run with it synthetics modeling that we've been doing with some partners. I think this is a great idea uh, to see how everything actually works out uh, by modeling, you know, different um, success rates and growth factors. And something that I'd like to maybe see the Council plan to do as we update our growth projections with the new census numbers. Thanks, Mayor Choi, and I know Malcolm might, uh, Malcolm Bruce might want to jump into this uh, question as well. So um, we are partnering with Edmonton Global and some other partners. Um, Glo Edmonton Global has led uh, the exercise around uh, thinking about building out a synthetic region. So really, what does, how do we look now and how might we look in the future? Part of the reason why that's really important for us is that so if if through the partnership that that uh, is being led through Edmonton Global, we have a we have a separate contract with Run With It Synthetics, which is a local regional company that really looks at how um, uses models to predict um, the future, future behavior gaps in some of the planning um, issues that might arise. And so if you can think about uh, having a synthetic region and what that might look like and, and building our region so that there's a there's a, just truly a model of it, you can run a series of questions. And those questions can, can answer, um, can provide answers like if we ask the model, you know, we're implementing this growth plan over the next uh, 25 or 30 years. Is it going to do what we hope it will do? How will it impact uh, the environment what will those road networks look like will it will it provide the kind of land savings that we think it will provide um are there gaps you know is there should we be focusing our attention in other areas and so using modeling to to um ask particular questions gives us a hint about whether or not we're on the right path or whether or not we have to course correct going forward and you know, I I am so amazed at the work of Run With It Synthetics led by its CEO Myrna Bittner, um, who who uh, started their shop in Strathcona County, and and really truly do work all over the world. But that kind of modeling 
uh, really helps you think about how you need to pivot or course correct or whether or not you need to put more energy into specific initiatives that are actually getting you a greater return on investment than you ever thought that they were. So, um, you know, we hope to be able to, um, the first the first piece of the work that we're doing right now should be done around April the 1st. And we hope to be able to share that work and we're doing that work specifically related to our growth plan as we do the five year interim review to make sure that uh, it's moving forward in a way that um, that needs to be done. Right. Sorry. William, do you, do you have anything else you uh, would like to contribute? Are you still there, William? Well, Karen, I'm, I'm not sure if he heard all your response. I'm sure he can go back and review the, uh, the answer. Uh, but I would like to say thank you. Uh, I know the EMRB does a really good job of uh, giving uh, a lot of uh, diverse communities uh, a voice. Uh, certainly, uh, Stony Plain has gotten to you know, contribute on the Integrated Regional Master uh, Transportation Master Plan. And I know the uh, ramp is spoken of uh, quite highly out here. So um, thank you for your presentation and hope to keep working with you guys, right? Thank you very much for your time today. And, and if I could, just before um, leaving, I'd just like to give a, uh, a shout out to your CAO. Um, I, I wanna just, you know, really there's a recognition that I'd like to give to all the CAOs in the region, but I really appreciate the sage advice from Tom when uh, I have questions and, uh, you know, CAOs are really rolling up their sleeves and providing the kind of support and wisdom uh, that the board needs as well. So I think, you know, that should just go note that should not go unnoticed. Thank you. Uh, we think he's pretty special too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, if that's all for the presentation, then uh, we will move on to 4.2. Uh, our guests from Edmonton Global, I think, are up next. Oh, look at that. They're already there. Uh, Hello. Good, good evening, yours. everyone. Hello. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gail stepanek Kaber, and I am on the board of Edmonton Global. I was one of the founding board members that started to spin up the organization, and we as a board hired the um, ever known Malcolm Bruce, who's with me today, and Dr. Rhea Gangley, who is our VP of Strategy and Investment. And in the background, Amanda Borman, who many of you know, is uh, supporting this presentation. So we'll have a short slideshow for you, but while we bring that up, I just wanted to say a big congratulations to all of the newly elected and the re-elected officials. I know that October seems a short time, time ago, but truly it's a lot to step into a council role and, and begin your new job. So I just wanted to say congratulations on behalf of Edmonton Global. And probably partly what everyone is thinking is, you know, we're a relatively new organization at Edmonton Global. We're into our fourth coming fifth year and what is the difference between EMRB and Edmonton Global? And it was so great to see Karen tonight. And, and we work very closely, as she noted, alongside all of her, her colleagues and the board. But the big difference is if EMRB is setting the conditions for us to truly be a regional player, Edmonton Global's role is to drive the investment, drive the, that economic growth and operationalize the regional policy plans that EMRB is making. So we pride ourselves in being a sister organization and we'll talk a bit more about that. So moving on to um, just an overview of Edmonton Global and many of you are aware of our purpose, but truly we would like to radically transform and grow the economy of Edmonton metropolitan region. So we think regionally, 
we do not think, you know, although Edmonton's in our name, it's all about driving growth to the region. And when we look at our principles, what we were built on, I know that Karen mentioned shared investment and shared benefit. We tend to have a very similar principle and it's shared investment, shared value. And this was taken from another global entity called Toronto Global and just talks about that importance of what it means to drive value to a region. We also pride ourselves in inclusion. We have one shareholder, one vote model. There is not one municipality that has a stronger voice than the other. So even though Edmonton is as large as it is, each um, shareholder has one vote. And then we're looking into how we harmonize those regional voices. And we're really proud to say that there was a site selector conference in Scottsdale, Arizona. And the team heard from a panel of site selectors that said that the biggest innovation in economic development space today are economic development agencies that support a regional approach. So I wanted to reinforce what you are supporting is definitely in the now across the world. So not only are we having harmonized regional voices, we pride ourselves in transparency and accountability. We have many touch points with um, not only you as council, but of course with Tom and his team and the EDOs are, that exist for Stony Plain. We also have um, virtual briefings. We also have newsletters. Um, we're about to spin up a podcast. So there are many different ways that you connect in with us. And of course, we respect local autonomy. We may be the ones that are driving economic deals to your council, but at the end of the day, you have the ability to make that decision. On to slide five, um, Amanda, really wanted to talk a bit about our priorities. We are fully based on FDI and trade. That is what our focus is. We have a strong regional brand that we've been working with your EDOs to build. It resonates globally and we're starting to get a lot of feedback that it is working. We remain very committed to organizational excellence and we are always looking at collaboration. And I think you heard that in Karen's talk as well. Um, we have um, a big, we have a, not, we have a, a small team, but they act big. And as a board member, I've seen this team navigate through COVID as even if it, it didn't exist. And we have really, um, are always onboarding new, new players, be it investment, marketing and communications um, and innovation. So now I'm gonna pass it on to co our, my colleague, uh, Malcolm, who's our CEO, and he'll speak to the strategy of Edmonton Global. Over to you, Malcolm. Thank you, Gail, Thank you, Gail. and, and uh, good evening, Council. Real pleasure to have this opportunity to speak with you. Next slide, please. So really, I just want to talk a little bit our strategy. Uh, the first one is around our approach, and you can see from this slide that it's a journey. And this journey has a number of component parts, and those component parts all have a number of partners uh, at different stages, at different inputs, but working to a common outcome which is to either attract a brand new investment or expansion opportunity into our region, or to take companies that are ready for the market export space out. And if you look at the way we look at uh, do this, the marketing effort and promotion and those kind of things, so that harmonized voice in a global context is really what starts it all. And then once companies or clients decide that they're interested in the region, we've got that attraction mechanism, then we really engage the EDO network to help us start to build out the portfolio, particularly for those municipalities that are interested in that particular deal, because not necessarily all are, but we share them. Then there are considerations by the client itself, which hopefully includes a site visit to our region uh, and to the Pacific sites that they're looking for. And then obviously there is a final investment decisions to be made by that client. And this is where obviously municipalities are very much involved because ultimately they will land in a local jurisdiction. And then finally, there's aftercare. And aftercare is really about what we do. And again, in partnership, particularly with your EDOs and making sure that those clients that have invested here are as successful as possible. 
And I'll give you an example. Polycar was a $40 million investment in a plastics value add manufacturing capacity. They made their final investment decision in August of 2019. They broke ground in August of 2021. And now we are continuing to provide them aftercare services to ensure that they meet all their needs. So it's very important to understand that this is a continuum and this work doesn't stop with those investments once they are decided upon. And I would say that this approach, as you can see, uh, has been recognized as uh, one of the best in the Americas, which was quite uh, which was quite nice to see in that journal most recently. Next slide, please. Now we also recognize we can't be all things to all people, and we're really focused on our global competitiveness. So where do we have strengths that we believe we can be competitive uh, with our global global counterparts? And when I say global, I don't mean Calgary, I don't mean Vancouver, I mean Dubai, India. Kuala Lumpur, Metro Denver, and those places. And so energy and clean tech is one of the sectors that we highlight, health and life science, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, food and agriculture, and then finally all underpinned by tremendous capacity in the technology and artificial intelligence fields here. Next, please. But we're also looking to the future. And Karen mentioned quite a bit about, you know, in the next 30 years, we're going to grow by a million people and 425,000 jobs. And these five big transformational opportunities is where we see we become globally known for in the next 15 to 20 years. Hydrogen, which I think is very well known, is the potential to be a hundred billion dollar a year business. And this region is incredibly well poised to be one of the primary deliverers, not just of hydrogen itself, but also the establishment of a net zero economy built on hydrogen, both demand, infrastructure, and supply. As well, we're well placed to meet global requirements. So we align quite nicely federally and provincially in the delivery of a hydrogen outcome. Biopharma, as you know, uh, diabetes research, the Edmonton Protocol in 2001, uh, and that research has now got a roadmap that takes us out to 2035, which will be published in the coming weeks, that hopefully will lead to a cure for diabetes that impacts over seven hundred million people globally today and <clears throat> including upwards of 90 percent of our first nations are potentially going to be infected with diabetes uh, over the next 20 years so it's very important that we work on this and we have the capacity here in our region small molecule drug manufacturing uh, not made in canada yet but this will give us a capacity in canada manufactured in this region food and agriculture so that ramp that was done was very important because it provides certainty that 1.7 million acres of land that is found within our region are going to have primary use of agriculture. Because <coughs> currently, excuse me, we are only growing for every dollar of ag sales or farm sales, we have one dollar of value add. The 31 note is what the Dutch do. And they have 4.4 million acres under agriculture and they generate a $150 billion where the GDP growth in our region at 1.7 million acres, we generate 8.6 billion. So even if we double that to two to one, we would be adding about $4.6 billion into our GDP. So food and agriculture is huge potential for us. Global logistics, another critical enabler, particularly as you'll see from your uh, key geographic position within the region. But well, we've had strong conversations that this inland port that we're Sort of rejuvenating around Port Alberta will have significant impact on our economy for the Edmonton metropolitan region. And then finally, as we know, uh, artificial intelligence, we have the, uh, we're ranked number three at the University of Alberta for artificial intelligence. And it's a key differentiator for us uh, compared to a number of our global competitors. Back to you, Gail. Thanks, Malcolm. So the next slide talks about um, Stony Plain. And I wanted to let everyone know who doesn't know me, I have been a resident of Parkland County since 2004 and worked in Edmonton, commuted every day. So made some nice miles <laughs> on my vehicle for 17 years. So I was a C-suite executive in Edmonton, but always prided ourselves that we bought local and bought in Stony Plain. And when I think about the choose to grow in Stony Plain brochure that you have, 
Um, I think about my daughter, who's now eight, who goes to Ecole Meridian, to the French Immersion School, and just our choice to raise a family in this community. And there, Stony Plain has so much going for it in terms of being a young, educated population with low taxation rate. And what's important about that is people make choices based on lifestyle, like my husband and I did. And moving to the next slide, if you think about how can Edmonton Global help Stony Plain, and we can help in many ways. We can promote Stony Plain to international investors. We work closely with your EDOs to identify your assets. We create a regional narrative where Stony Plains opportunities are highlighted. We also support ongoing connections for that Malcolm mentioned, the aftercare, the investor aftercare. And then we connect local businesses to trade and export opportunities. So with the next slide, it's all about being better together. And I think our messages with Karen are really intertwining, which is really great to see. And for us, it's really about that regional value proposition. So when we pitch as a region, we have access to regional assets. And so Edmonton Global is that connection between local opportunities and global investors. And it's really about a regional approach for investment attraction. And we use site selectors. And site selectors can get access to many regional assets by connecting in with, with single organizations. So in this way, they can connect with the region in a way that's unachievable if multiple organizations, like if we were all going at it alone, um, it would be really difficult to get someone's attention. And Malcolm alluded to that. So although Stony Plain may not see that direct impact of an investment, it will realize indirect and induce benefits into the community. Now, I just think about myself coming from Edmonton as um, my employer, but doing my local um, shopping and everything else in Stony Plain. And we see that as we band together as a region, we can do more. So in terms of the next slide is about our ecosystem. And we have worked hard as a team on identifying everyone in our ecosystem. And so this includes the likes of every shareholder council, of EMRB, um, talks to trade commissioner offices, if you look at this, and you can't see this in detail, but we do have this in our mid-year review, and it just talks to our collaborative efforts. And I love the, the idea of it takes a village to bring investment to the region. So we have to collaborate locally because it will help us compete globally. And more than ever today, as Canada is trying to go at it, it's, it's up to us as Edmonton Global to support invest in Alberta, to support invest in Canada, and band together regionally, provincially, and then nationally. So that's why it's so important for us to continue to work alongside your municipality, highlight your unique assets. We can definitely bring a stronger regional narrative to international audiences and ensure that this region gets the attention it deserves. And I will now turn it back to Malcolm to speak to some of our great results. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Uh, just, just a couple of quick slides to talk to results before we go into questions. Next, please. So this slide, as I will say, is dated by a couple of days. So now we're at 16 final investment decisions uh, and the, uh, the job creation, permanent job creation is at 400 plus. So I'm really happy to say that there's a, a, a good size of investment deals. And these are deals that we've had some physical or a touch point in. Um, so we haven't counted deals, for example, that Fort Saskatchewan landed up in their nick of the woods or AIHA is necessarily landed to the Dow facility for upwards of $10 billion is not included in these numbers. These are really only ones that we've had direct input in. But as you can see, $1.7 billion of investment, 2,600 uh, construction jobs, and now 400 permanent jobs on 16 deals that have been uh, finalized and uh, brought to the region. Next slide, please. And then the ones that were announced last year, it's now seven. So that's part of the change that you see from the previous slide. 
and you can see here the air products is a significant one that was brought in but also the fats which was an expansion facility med ppe which is now in and then the more recent one that was announced two weeks ago which is the hcl uh, tech one so there still are three pending decisions that have yet to be publicly announced and that's why they're not on this slide um, and those will be announced from 2021 once we have either the owners in market or they've authorized us to actually release it in a public way so that we're able to highlight that to everybody in place. So overall, we're very happy with uh, where things are going, but we're never satisfied. Um, so you'll see that we've really uh, taken this one and trying to move it to uh, the next level for 2022 and beyond. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Malcolm. And with that, um, we will turn it back to council for questions. Thank you. And I will just start with our mayor and see if he has uh, anything he'd like to uh, add to the discussion. I don't think he's there. Uh, sorry about that. We'll, uh, we'll go to council then. Um, Councillor Pelechko, if you have a question. Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thank you very much, Jonathan Global, for the fantastic uh, presentation today. I just want to have you elaborate a little bit on how you talk about how you bring this investment to, uh, to our local area. You talk about a small touch point. Where does that touch point really start at, and how do you attribute your touch point to the projects moving forward? So it, it, if, I, if I may, Gail, it, it's, so what happens is each deal is different. So for example, the air products deal, what they really needed was the partnership piece. They're, in a, they're, they're an international company and in order to secure federal and provincial uh, incentives or offsets or grant programming, what they really need was to demonstrate inclusion with uh, a larger partnership network. So we were able to bring in people like Women Building Futures, some First Nations that were able to then show some uh, a greater benefit to the community that enabled that deal to go through. So that's the kind of work that we could do with those individual companies. And then we are still working uh, primarily with the municipality that we're landed in uh, to uh, get the shovels in the ground, which they're hoping to do uh, this year. So again, it just depends on what their need is. Uh, we'll drive to the, uh, the the work that we'll do for them. Thank you. So just to elaborate just a tiny bit, if I can, Deputy Mayor. Yes, please. Um, where, where do you find this? How do, you, how do you reach out to those individuals? Or are those individuals actually seeking Edmonton Global to do some of that work for them? That's a really great question, Councillor. So we, we've actually got three kind of strategies, if you will. We have a reactive one, which is the here and now. So we have companies that come to us literally on a weekly basis to say we're interested in potentially investing in the Edmonton metropolitan region. This is what we're looking for. And what, this is the kind of lead that we'll take and fan out to all the economic development officers across the region and say, do you have anything that might fit this bill? Is your council interested in uh, looking at this as a potential option? And then you can opt in. Then there's also what we would call the strategic work that we're doing. So we've now looked at, and it's kind of reverse engineering need. So we've looked at those four sectors in some detail now, identified where there are gaps in the value chain, and then we go hunting for that specific gap to fill. So for example, pulse fractionation is a great one. So it's a value added agriculture component. So we know that in our, in our current agriculture system, we're sending out 95% of everything that leaves this, uh, this region is, is unrefined. It's the raw product. So if we can actually create a pulse fractionation capacity here, that means we start to refine the product. So what we've been doing the last 18 months is hunting for pulse fractionation capacity that will be able to fill those gaps. Uh, and so we've built business cases around it, which is essentially a product that we then take to market. And we're very specific. We're getting very sophisticated in hunting those specific companies that are international in scope or domestic, if there are any here, 
that we can then approach and ask if they're interested in being able to fill that gap. So that's kind of a one to three year journey that we try and do. And then there's these five transformational pieces, which I highlighted a little earlier, where we're actually starting to build our value proposition so that we become world leaders. So others come to us to say, we want to be involved. Hydrogen's a great example of that. Um, we had DMG who runs a number of the global hydrogen or energy conferences around the world, including the largest one in Dubai called Audipec. And they came to us and said, we really want to partner with you to run the, Can uh, the first ever Canadian hydrogen conference in this Edmonton metropolitan <clears throat> region. And we want to do it for the next 10 years. So what that allows us to do now, we've got this long-term partnership. We're going to bring the world to our region and we're going to start, uh, start relatively small uh, this year because of COVID and restrictions. But our goal is to make it the largest hydrogen conference in the world. So that's the different touch points that we can bring. We're doing the same for technology with Nano Canada on a conference in June. And then we're also looking at how to expand uh, farm fair from its current context to something much more global in terms of uh, food tech, ag tech, along with the beef genetics that it currently uh, highlights. Yeah, if I could. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, one more quick question, and it's uh, a little bit of a different question. So Edmonton Global, um, when you look at it from a small prospect of it similar to a chamber of commerce it looks after business it looks to bring business to the region and stuff like that how do you differentiate yourself from the chamber uh, at the local level of wanting to bring local business to being a much broader perspective than what you what we are today so how do you how do you move into that area without having the chamber flair so first of all, the chambers are critical and par uh, partners. So they, what they do is, and if you look at your chamber, for example, many of the companies that are in the chamber are small, medium-sized enterprises. And what they really do is they're incredible um, network of intelligence for us to be able to identify high potential, high growth companies that we can take to the export market. Because one of the weaknesses of the Alberta economy, as you know, is up till 2014, 80% that was everything that was built or serviced in Alberta was consumed in Alberta. And so there wasn't this high degree of uh, market export uh, appetite within uh, our, businesses our business community, unless you were fairly large or very specific. So what, what this has helped us do is create awareness and programming and partnership with our chambers to be able to identify those companies because we're not in the business retention and expansion business. Our business is to take companies that are ready into the market export space or getting ready to go there, as well as to attract investment in, like big investment. So if there's a company, for example, that wants to expand that's very specific, well, we work with your EDOs for that specific thing and we'll hand it off as quickly as we can to the EDO. The EDOs are great partners for us and, and yours in particular, because of course, they're another source of knowledge. So I, I don't see any redundancy at all with the chambers. I feel very, uh, it's a very collaborative and complementary. And if I was use one, uh, one example is, as you know, we, we talk about FDI, so foreign direct investment. We talk about market export as our, as our main deliverables. But one other thing that we have done um, regionally is facilitate conversations. So the Regional Air Services Opportunity Fund where we needed to get back into the direct destination business as quickly as possible once international flights would come in. The region, we facilitated a conversation with EIA and the rest of the region. And at the end, the region decided that it was sufficient enough outcome that we needed to jumpstart the recovery process when we got back to international flights, that we created a $15 million fund. And I say we, the region, not we Edmonton Global, Edmonton Global manages the fund because that's what the regional mayors wanted us to do and the regional councils. So we do that on their behalf, but it was the chambers that were instrumental in bringing business to the table to understand why getting these direct destinations from a business perspective was so important. So they were great partners in, in the creation of the Regional Air Services Opportunity Fund. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Pletchko. Those were some great questions. Uh, Councillor Hansard, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. I have a question for Mr. I'm sorry I can't read your last name, Malcolm. I like to use a more 
formal name when I'm addressing someone. Um, thank you very much for your report. I have a particular interest in the bioforma comments that you made. And I'm curious, uh, I've known about the Edmonton Protocol, Isotechnica, University of Alberta, uh, absolutely outstanding award-winning work in trying to conquer uh, diabetes, particularly di type 1 diabetes. <coughs> <coughs> sorry. Would, would you clarify, sorry, let me take a drink of water. Would you clarify what you said about moving toward a cure for diabetes? And is this something that um, the promotion of their work, is that something Edmonton Global actually has their hands in? So the short answer is absolutely yes on both accounts, both to, towards a cure and also uh, <coughs> and So one of the things COVID forced us to do was reposition ourselves and how we deliver our mar and market messages. So how do we speak to people outside? Sorry, I think my whole building lights just went out downtown. Anyway, so um, the uh, so we did a webinar that we, you know, we we, we took to different places with support of the Trade Commissioner Services into places like Copenhagen, where Nova Nordisk is, which is, as you know, one of the major diabetic or diabetes uh, companies in the world. And I just was so taken by that webinar, I figured there must be something we can do better than what we're doing. So we got the Alberta Diabetes Institute together, we got Alberta Innovates together, and then we got the medical economists, those that you know work on projects, and we said, okay, how can we actually activate this and bring as quickly as possible the cure for diabetes uh, here coming out of this region? Um, so with Dr. Shapiro uh, and the Diabetes Institute and a number of others like the Lee Kai Shake Institute, the virology department, we put together uh, in partnership a roadmap and that roadmap will start being published. And essentially it, it looks at three year increments up to 2035 and we figure that under the current context, the cure for type 2 diabetes should be in reach by 2035. Now, those steps along the way are what other technologies are coming along and how do we commercialize them? Not all will be successful and we won't be successful necessarily on the plan that we've mapped out completely, but what we've now got is a roadmap. And that roadmap, we're able to talk uh, to investors. So as you know, uh, uh, as you're probably aware, for example, uh, phase two clinical trials will cost somewhere in the 350 to 400 million dollars. While we've currently in discussions with various partners globally that want to come here to help fund those trials so we can actually potentially accelerate uh, the creation of a cure. And the reason why we're very confident is Dr. Shapiro has cured type one diabetes in mice today. And so that treatment is how can we then start to accelerate moving that into both humans, but also apply it to type two diabetes. So this is why we think biopharma life sciences is critical as well as small molecule manufacturing. We think that's the other real close, uh, close opportunity that we think uh, we can get to. And uh, we're just looking for a little bit of support from the federal government. The province has already stepped up and if we get it from the feds in this next budget, we'll be able to establish the first small molecule manufacturing capacity in Canada here. And as you know, 80% of most antivirals and stuff are small molecules. So they're pills, they're not vaccines. Vaccines will go to Montreal and Mississauga, but we can do the small molecules here. A follow up to that, if, um, if allowed, please. Um, Alberta is one of the few provinces that has not approved covering the devices that do the automatic reading, which can transmit the results of blood sugar levels to devices so that parents can monitor their children throughout the night. And if, if, if a child is away from the parent, uh, they don't, there's less panic. And uh, the amount of fear that families live with when a child, especially a little child, is diagnosed with type one diabetes is frightening. 
I'm wondering if your uh, efforts around the uh, biopharma include anything about trying to bring Alberta on board, like BC, Nova Scotia, um, New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, even the uh, Northwest Territories have covered these devices, and that's where an insert goes in the arm and then a reader um, can be scanned without waking a child in the night and so forth. I'm just wondering if you guys have an opportunity to speak into that because if we're talking 2035, these children are growing up during these years and it can be very, very difficult. And I'm just sort of putting it in front of you. It's not really uh, an intense question around that, but do you have an opportunity to speak into this and encourage the province to cover these uh, devices under health care? They are about $500 every two weeks. Many families cannot afford that. And even health care coverage does not cover it all. So for that specific issue, no, we tend not to uh, not to drive those necessarily um, on the advocacy front. But what we do tend to do is try and ensure that companies are successful for establishing themselves there. So if we can arrange a discussion with, say, AHS or the provincial health agency, then we will. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we're we're going to uh, you know stand on the side of advocacy say that we need to deploy these devices for these children and you need to cover them that's not our role our role is to say there's an opportunity to be able to deploy these devices um, we think that alberta is the right place to do that and we would encourage folks to look at that so we are we are not in the same in that business per se but we are in the business of trying to create conditions so businesses can be successful here which hopefully will work to the common good of, uh, of our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hansard, and thank you, Malcolm. Uh, are there any other questions? I do have a couple of questions, uh, if I can. Um, actually, one's more of a comment, but um, <clears throat> the first one is similar to my fellow councillor's comment or question to the previous presenter. Uh, regarding funding and sustainability. I'm curious if you could um, uh, maybe just uh, give a, a quick uh, description of your efforts to maybe also find alternative partners there to help funding. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great question and we're always on uh, the, 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 the work on how do we better uh, maximize and optimize the committed dollars that uh, we've received. Um, so first of all, as part of the initial setup of Edmonton Global, one of the things that we looked at was business partnerships. Now I will say COVID's kind of delayed that a little bit, um, but we are still uh, looking for partnerships and, and there are global best practices we looked at that have those in place. And, and in Canada, that includes places like Montreal International, Toronto Global, which is our sister organization. It never replaces all public dollars, but what it does do is it shows there's, and it's not a membership per se, it's an investment. So it goes back to that earlier comment about um, the chambers. We are not a membership organization. We look for investment. And the way we're phrasing it is that, you know, a healthy ecosystem is good for business. It retains talent, gets the right culture here. It promotes healthy and livability. All those things that gives to quality of life that makes for a happy workforce makes them want to stay. So businesses should want those kind of things so that they're able to tap into top talent that's coming out of our post-secondaries and our high schools to be able to work the work that they need to do. So we're always looking for that. Uh, but I will say that the value of Edmonton Global was really recognized by our shareholders in October of 2020, where they recognized that there was some real opportunity. So they invested additional dollars into us so we're now at the $5 million mark for um, total investment, of which it's a cost share formula. So you'll see that 70% of the freight is uh, is paid by uh, Edmonton, for example. Uh, but they still have, as Gail mentioned, a one shareholder, one vote. Um, so when you look at the investment that 
uh, Stony Plain has done, for every dollar you invest, we're now leveraging 67 other regional dollars to be able to deliver on a better outcome. So uh, we really are capitalizing on the collective good to be able to create better outcomes by maximizing every one of your dollars. And thank you for that uh, response. And then just to uh, a bit of a comment, um, obviously uh, there's uh, general uh, public unease with uh, doing business in China reflected currently in sort of uh, what they are calling the, uh, the pandemic uh, games right now is just a reflection of some of that uh, public unease. I did notice in previous uh, reports uh, that you guys have divided out the FDI by region uh, where it was elicited from and I'm not seeing uh, that type of breakdown anymore. So my comment would be that um, I wouldn't mind seeing that. Yeah, very happy to do that in. And the Greater Barrier Area is a, a region that we're interested in. There are investments, as you know, I mean, Alberta's got over $15 billion from China invested in it currently. Um, and so there are other opportunities, particularly in the cargo space by moving product to China and vice versa. I mean, 90% of of uh, e-commerce now, a large chunk of that, it comes out of the Asian marketplace and particularly China. So the realities are we're doing business with them every single day. Um, and the question is, we just need to be walking into those business arrangements with our eyes wide open and following the prudent measures. And we've, we're very, um, I would say, conscious about what we do and where we do it. Mm -hmm. And we also have to be very cognizant that the U.S. have published things like sensitive technology lists. While Canada will never do that, from what I understand, we can't deal with China on a sensitive technology if we're going to continue to partner with the Americans. So we have to be realistic about what we do. So we see agriculture, energy, and a little bit in the health space as probably the three key markets for China in the areas that we're looking at. Uh, thank you for those uh, answers. Uh, just checking again for any other questions from anyone. So with that, um, not seeing any, uh, thank you guys very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, I especially liked uh, uh, your comment, Gail, uh, harmonizing uh, regional voices. Uh, I think that's something you guys uh, certainly do do. So uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, guys. Good night. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Take care. All right. So moving on to 6.30, looking around the room here for, does anybody need a comfort break? I'm not seeing any head shake, so we'll just uh, keep on rambling along. 4.3. Uh, Edmonton Metropolitan Transit Services Commission update. Um, oh look, and they've already got them queued up for us and everything. Uh, welcome, uh, sorry I'm not uh, your name, Paul, Mr. Jankowski. Welcome, Thank you. Please, uh, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and maybe just before I get started, maybe I'll kick it to uh, Councillor Lori, who is uh, one of our our key board members. I'll maybe Councillor Lori. I don't know if you want to say a couple words first. For sure. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Uh, so, Council, in January of 2021, the province officially formed the EMTSC, and we were excited to welcome Mr. Jankowski as our inaugural CEO and employee number one of the commission. Since that time, Mr. Jankowski has been building a fantastic team around him and moving things forward as we work towards an operational opening day service plan. He has done this all through the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic and the significant impacts it has had on public transit. I'm excited to welcome Paul here tonight and Stony Plain is the third of all the member municipalities to receive this presentation. The presentation will provide some history and a look back on how we got here and a look forward and give us perspective on how the future may look under the Regional Transit Service Commission. With that, I would like to turn the floor over to Mr. Jankowski for this evening's presentation. Thank you very much, Councillor Laurie, and uh, thank you very much, members of Council and uh, Mr. Chair, for the invitation to come and speak before you. Uh, this is the uh, kind of the third leg of the regional 
stool, uh, if I can put it that way. Uh, and last but not least, in terms of the uh, regional initiatives that you're hearing about today, um, I am here to speak to the issue of the integrated transit single solution that uh, Councillor Laurie kind of alluded to in his introductory comments. And actually, Councillor Laurie kind of touched on probably about half of my presentation. So I'm hoping to keep this fairly short for you. I know that uh, it's been a little bit of a uh, a go here. You've been at it for about an hour and a half. Today, if I can just flip to the next slide. Today, I'm, I am going to provide a little bit of back history, uh, speak a little bit to the current membership of the Commission, talk a little bit about the current mandate and uh, the mandate that was dictated by the provincial approval, speak to our work uh, with uh, relative to the uh, preparation for delivery of a regional service as well as the integration of the local services in our member municipalities and uh, and really work take you through what the board approved in uh, late December as the work plan for 2022. Um, Mr. Chair, I know you've been quite interested also in the financials of the uh, various presentations and I'll touch on that as well. So as Councillor Laurie indicated, uh, in January of 2021, that was really the culmination of many years of work that uh, had taken place over the, uh, the last probably decade plus. Um, but maybe I'll start with 2018. There was a significant decision that was, uh, was made by the government of Alberta in 2018 to allocate or to fund uh, the development of a business case for the study of integrating transit in the capital region. Um, and I, I, there is a direct tie-in to a lot of the work that uh, Karen Witchuk spoke about. Um, our, our, we came about largely as a result of a lot of the work that was carried out not only by the EMRB, but also its predecessor. Uh, and in 2018, the government of Alberta funded uh, are the preparation of the business case to the tune of about $3.7 million. And Mayor Choi and the other mayors, 13 mayors of the capital region municipalities, signed an MOU to undertake that work. That work carry, was carried out over 2019 and 2020, and it resulted in the preparation of, first of all, a business case relative to the integration or relative to, to uh, working towards one solution to uh, really serve all 13 members and uh, later that year once the discussions were taken to the individual 13 councils that resulted in eight municipalities really coming together and signing an addendum to move forward with a revised business case based on the membership of those eight municipalities. That then led to the uh, the, the work that uh, Councillor Lori described in early 2021 and uh, led to my, my hiring and us starting to build the organization. So next slide, please. Where we are now is uh, we're, we're working towards the, um, the, the execution on what the business case really laid out. And the two principal elements that the business case spoke to was that through the integration of the, uh, the provision of, of transit services across these eight municipalities, uh, it really felt that there are two large opportunities that can be realized. realized. First of all, the uh, transit services can be delivered more efficiently and more effectively on a regional level. Uh, effectively, what the region, what, what the business case proposed is through the integration of the various administrative efforts around the provision of transit services by consolidating the uh, eight uh, approaches into one approach, there was an opportunity to capitalize on uh, efficiencies of scale and to uh, minimize the administrative burden and administrative cost of continuing to manage eight different approaches. So that was, uh, that was the first imperative. The second imperative was to really address the quality of the services. And as is no surprise to anybody, the quality imperative is something that we are working towards, but it's fair to say that that's been that that approach or that that objective has been significantly impaired by the uh, the impacts of COVID over the course of the last two years. Um, in terms of transit services across North America, across uh, uh, Canada, 
um, the uh, the level of transit ridership over the last two years has significantly decreased. And so the uh, question of working towards a higher level of service for all of the geographic area is something that is probably a little bit more of a longer term uh, objective. Uh, at this point, we're focusing on, and I'll speak to this a little bit later, focusing on figuring out what the correct or what the appropriate levels of service would be for opening day, uh, recognizing that we're now in a period where we're recovering from the impacts of COVID. So moving on to who is, uh, who is the EMTSC, the short answer is you are, along with seven other municipalities, and they are represented on this slide, the darker tinge municipalities are the eight members and all eight members are represented on the board of directors each municipality uh, has appointed one member from elected council to serve on the board our board is currently chaired by uh, councillor Wes Broadhead from the city of St Albert and the vice chair of the board is from the city of Leduc, Councillor Glenn Finstead. Uh, but in addition to that, we do have a, uh, a couple of chairs of our two principal committees. Councillor Laurie is the chair of our audit and finance committee and sits on the board. And Councillor Gord Harris from the city of uh, Fort Saskatchewan is our chair of the human resources and compensation committee. Uh, rounding out the board, we've got Councillor Munkoff Swain from the City of Beaumont. We've got Councillor uh, Ben Gronstad uh, from, uh, sorry, Gronberg from the town of Devon. Uh, we've also got uh, Councillor Stuart Houston from the City of Spruce Grove. Uh, and I think that rounds out, oh, and, and definitely Councillor uh, Andrew Knack from the City of Edmonton. Um, so, the uh, the eight municipalities are represented on the board and there is uh, in the original governance bylaw there is a uh, uh, an appropriate um, uh, vote uh, allocation methodology that it that reflects the uh, constituencies and the size of the constituencies and the size of the anticipated transit services that uh, uh, are represented uh, on in terms of the voting patterns and, and voting uh, protocols for the board. But the eight municipalities that you see constitute the board. So moving forward then, the mandate of the board, and it really ties into what both Karen Witchuk and uh, Malcolm Bruce and the folks from Edmonton Global spoke to, um, the, the uh, integration of transit services and uh, uh, the preparation to deliver an integrated transit service to serve these eight municipalities really plays into the, the larger uh, regional objectives that uh, exist uh, and, and that have been identified by all of the municipalities. Um, we, we will be playing an instrumental role in uh, the economic recovery of the metropolitan region uh, over the course of the next little while and certainly through the integration of these transit services we will also be contributing to the achievement of the broader regional objectives that continue to be identified through EMRB and Edmonton Global's good work. Moving on then, uh, one of the things that we've uh, we've uh, focused on, and I've I've spoken to this already, is the longer term uh, objective of providing better service. Of really, and and count. Um, Karen Wichuk spoke to this. In terms of the integrated transportation regional master plan, um, there, there were a number of improvements that were identified in terms of capital investment, but our focus is on the operational side. And so through the course or over the course of the next few years, we will be focusing on identifying where are the opportunities to increase transit, uh, but that will be balanced by a fiscally responsible uh, approach to that, one which will capitalize on the efficiencies that we will be gaining through the reduction of, of the overall administrative burden of eight different administrations looking at this as opposed to one, um, and through the uh, elimination of duplication and, and, and uh, complexity. Um, we will be aligning with the other regional plans, the, uh, the transportation master plan, and we will also be seeking to address some of the key findings that 
we've certainly uncovered in terms of some of our initial survey work. What we did earlier in 2021 was we actually went out and we spoke to a number of residents across the eight member municipalities. And on the left hand side of the, uh, the slide, you can see some of the key findings. The, our, our residents across our communities and the eight member municipalities do see a tremendous opportunity here uh, and are hoping for us to achieve better improvements uh, in service and, and also to gain some uh, efficiencies in the delivery of those services. I'll move on to the discussion about regional service and local service. And this is a, a little bit of a uh, conceptual plan and this I would encourage and some members of council might remember that through the preparation of the original business case there was a, uh, a really nice map that was developed uh, in, in the Ernst & Young work. Uh, it was a, a nice map which showed the longer term objectives of a conceptual service plan and it really showed a lot of future opportunities for not only connecting between the seven municipalities around Edmonton into the Edmonton core, but also uh, showed some increased opportunities for connection between the seven surrounding municipalities. I think it's fair to say, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, over the course of the last two years, we've identified some challenges, particularly with respect to the latter. Um, while we fully expect and in, in working with all of the municipalities and in particular with the city of Edmonton, while we fully expect that uh, transit ridership will rebound to four key destinations within Edmonton uh, most quickly, and those four key destinations are the ones that really had higher levels of ridership or the highest levels of ridership between the uh, outside municipalities or the surrounding municipalities and points with in Edmonton, those four key destinations were the downtown business area the and the three post-secondary uh, academic institutions within Edmonton. And I, I was listening with some interest to one of the earlier speakers um, speaking about the decisions around quality of life that people make and residents make as they decide where to invest, in which communities to invest, to actually locate and to live in. Uh, but there is this discussion point that uh, continues to, uh, to come forward that as our children mature, as the children from those surrounding municipalities mature uh, and get to uh, the age where they're considering post-secondary uh, education, those the, the opportunities to uh, achieve that education tend to be concentrated within the city of Edmonton and there is an, a, a higher level of demand associated with potential transit ridership between those municipalities outside of Edmonton and those post-secondary academic institutions. So over the course of the next year, we're looking at where will the ridership rebound? Where will where should we be concentrating our uh, our initial service offering? And I'll speak to the timing of that in just a second. And the heavier lines that you see represented on the map in front of you are the ones that we believe at this point that we should be concentrating on for the uh, the first go round or the initial service offerings. We will also be looking at potentials for longer term connectivity between the various municipalities outside of the city limits of the city of Edmonton. Uh, I think it's fair to say that in comparison to that nice map that was included in the original business case, it now appears that some of those may be a little longer term objective objectives given the fact that the uh, we're, we're dealing with a situation where we've got to look at ridership recovery over the next number of years. So let me speak also to the local service. Um, what we've also, uh, what the business case also identified is that uh, as part of the uh, integration of services for the opening day service, 
local services within those municipalities where it exists today with uh, so for example within the city of St. Albert within the city of uh, Spruce Grove and the new uh, service that has started between the uh, the town of Stony Plain and the city of Spruce Grove as well as the on-demand services that are now materializing in a number of the local service local municipalities or smaller municipalities outside of Edmonton all of those will be integrated into the opening day service that the commission will seek to deliver in early 2023. The one key difference that I want to speak to is on the fiscal side. Um, local services, by virtue of the fact that they will continue to be 100% funded by each municipality, what we will be doing is determining those service levels for the local services in conjunction with you and your administrations. So as we move forward into 2023 and beyond, we will be having discussions with you and with your administrations uh, to identify what are the appropriate levels of service in your mind, um, what the costs associated with the delivery of those local services would be, and uh, how that would get integrated into the service offering on opening day and beyond. That is different than the cost formula that was identified through the business uh, plan for regional services. Regional services will be cost shared uh, and the formula for allocating those costs will be developed over the, uh, the next six to 12 months as we identify the, uh, the, the proportions of benefiting communities uh, and as we identify what the most appropriate cost sharing uh, formulas for rec recommendation to the board will be uh, subject to board approval. Those are the ones that will then be used to allocate the proportionate costs to the eight member municipalities going forward from 2023 on. I will skip now to a discussion about the work that the board has approved for 2022. And I've spoken a little bit about that opening day service in the original business case and in the uh, a, a, in the original uh, thinking behind setting up this this commission it was proposed that the the commission would start operating the integrated service in late 2022 that was however prior to the delays and you know slight delays in getting started um, I think that was pre predicated on the CEO, for example, being hired in late uh, 2020. In fact, uh, I came on board in mid-2021. And so given the fact that uh, we've now gone through some of the initial startup, what we proposed to the board in late 2021 was that the more appropriate timeline for starting uh, service, integrated service delivery under the EMTSC umbrella uh, that that timing is uh, more appropriately uh, considered for early 2023. So now the board's approved a work plan where over the course of the next uh, three to three to five months, we will be going through a uh, service detailed service planning exercise and a bottom up costing to determine what are the most appropriate recommendations to bring forward to the board for that intermunicipal or regional component of the work. We will also be working with your administrations to identify what are the, the appropriate services to be considered for local service delivery in each one of the municipalities, except for Edmonton. In Edmonton, the original business case uh, reflected and uh, Edmonton approved a uh, service a, a service model transition which had the local service delivery in the city of Edmonton remaining with the city for the next three to four years. So we will be looking at integrating the delivery of local services in each one of the seven municipalities outside of Edmonton but we will be working with the city of Edmonton to figure out over the course of the next four to five months, how does the intermunicipal or the regional service integrate with the local service delivery that Edmonton and Edmonton Transit Services will continue to deliver within the Edmonton city boundaries. 
the last thing under the the bucket of ser- bucket of work uh, for defining opening day service, the last thing that I will highlight, and I've already had discussions with uh, your town manager Tom and and uh, with the other CAOs across the region. Over the course of the next uh, number of months, we will be negotiating the appropriate service delivery agreements to transition the services from those municipalities that are currently operating them uh, to the EMTSC oversight and control over the course of the next year. Those discussions, I think, are not going to be one size fits all. We're going to have different uh, agreements with each one of the current service owners uh, reflecting some of the arrangements that have been made by each municipality for their particular services. So over the course of the next number of months, I propose to continue working with Tom and with Melanie Sampson and, and the other members of the administration uh, that have been participating over the course of the last number of years uh, to finalize the negotiation of the appropriate agreements to transition the oversight of the Cut delivery up. of that to to EMTSC control over the course of the next few months. Um, switching then to the uh, the next uh, uh, group of of uh, or next bucket of activities, we will continue to stand up the commission. Um, you may have heard that uh, in January we actually moved into the uh, EMTSC's new offices, but the offices have not yet been completed. Um, we have capitalized on the donation of, for example, uh, some some surplus furniture from uh, the city of Edmonton. We're very appreciative of that, uh, but we uh, we are awaiting the delivery of the remainder of the furniture, and uh, we will be uh, uh, completing the work of building the new offices and I look forward with great anticipation to holding the first meeting of the board in our new boardroom uh, sometime towards the end of the first quarter uh, assuming that uh, we can get through the, the current pandemic restrictions by that time. We will also be continuing to build our internal resources building up our, our uh, staff complement and looking at the appropriate transition of staffing from the member municipalities to uh, into the EMTSC uh, in order to minimize the, the costs and uh, uh, to ensure that there are the appropriate agreements executed with all the municipalities to allow that. And we will be developing a uh, standalone brand for the EMTSC services to be implemented for opening day in 2023. We will also be looking at, moving on to the next slide, ensuring that this organization is not only a uh, short-term organization, but building in everything that's required to have long-term sustainability. This is something that many municipalities have participated in building up to this point over the last number of years and decades. And what uh, one of my primary objectives over the course of the next year is to start building the frameworks to ensure long-term sustainability. The board has indicated that they immediately want to get into the identification of strategic objectives, looking at three specific timeframes. The last one of which really coincides with your term of council, uh, e each term of, of council of all of the muni member municipalities. We will also be looking at the development of a long-term financial framework uh, in, in order to ensure that there is intergenerational equity, that we continue to plan for the future to make sure that the investments that are made today are paid for in the appropriate way uh, to, uh, to allow us to spread the costs across all of the benefiting generations and to ensure that we don't have uh, peaks and valleys in terms of uh, in, in terms of funding needs coming to the member municipalities. And last but not least, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, developing and pursuing sustainable transit funding options. Um, there is a specific slide on this, and uh, I'm going to just jump to that uh, if, if we can just transition. Traditionally, and this should be no surprise to many members of council, traditionally in Canada, transit operations have only been funded through three sources, fares, fare revenues, non-fair revenues such as advertising and last but not least 
the municipal tax subsidy required to operate transit. While we anticipate and, and we're working towards uh, achieving efficiencies through the creation of this commission model that integrates the, uh, the various uh, operations into one, it is fair to say, and, and Councillor Laurie, for example, has been instrumental in pushing us, that we do have to find a, uh, or, or seek a different kind of funding solution for long-term transit uh, sustainability, transit uh, operational sustainability. Right now, the focus of many of the operating entities is on recovering from COVID. And so over the course of the last number of years, we have heard uh, and, and we've been very grateful, many municipalities have been very grateful for the support and assistance that the federal government and in some provinces, the province has also provided to address some of the operating cost shortfalls that have materialized as a result of COVID. There is a, another issue, however, and that is something that we are going to start pursuing more actively over the course of this year, and that is looking at the longer term funding approach uh, in order to minimize the reliance on the municipal tax base. Are there opportunities to look at a different sort of funding model? Uh, is, is there is, is there something that we might want wish to collectively advance uh, as we we prepare, for example, for next year's uh, uh, provincial uh, election campaigns? So those are that's the kind of thinking that we're going to engage in over the course of this year. Um, one of the benefits is that as we're now representing the residents of eight different municipalities as we're representing the the communities that uh, contain over a million people now uh, almost a million and a half people within our eight member municipalities there is a little bit stronger voice that we can have in terms of approaching both the senior levels of government to seek uh, discussions and engage in discussions uh, to look at uh, perhaps a longer term financial framework that uh, can minimize impact on the municipal tax levies. And that brings me to my second to last slide. Um, one of the things that I wanna highlight for this council as I've been highlighting for all of the councils that I've been presenting to is the board made a very uh, made a key decision in approving the 2022 operating budget. Uh, it was something that the board felt very strongly on. Um, we are not going to be re uh, requisitioning any kind of uh, additional funding from the member municipalities in 2022. Um, the board has identified that the uh, the 2022 startup costs now, given that we're not starting operations until 2023, those costs will be debt financed. What that means, however, is that we will require some additional securities. Um, our current uh, debt limit of $5 million has been secured by two of the member municipalities, the two largest ones, the city of Edmonton and the uh, city of St. Albert. Uh, to the tune of two-thirds, one-third. And uh, as we go through this year, we will be uh, reaching a point where the overall stand-up costs will be approaching $7 million, which will demand an increase in the debt financing for the stand-up. Uh, but because of the desire to delay requisitions to the member municipalities until 2023, which is the year in which we will start uh, operations under the EMTSC banner, we will require and we will be uh, approaching uh, some of the member municipalities over the course of the next uh, number of months. We will be requiring additional securities, additional guarantees, as opposed to an outright requisition for funding in 2022. So I am reaching the end of my presentation. Uh, in summary, this one integrated regional transit solution will, in the fullness of time, uh, allow us to make improvements in the service, but immediately will allow us to deliver those services more efficiently uh, in order to support a regional approach to managing growth. Uh, and will benefit to uh, and will provide a benefit to the uh, economic recovery of the metropolitan area as we go through the next two key years. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jankowski. Um, 
With that, uh, we'll open it to questions from Council. Anyone on the uh, virtual end there? Uh, Mayor Choi or Councillor Laurie? No questions for me. Just like to thank Mr. Jankowski for his presentation this evening to Council. All right. Well, I would also echo those uh, those comments. Uh, if there's no one uh, with any questions, I would like to just say thank you, uh, Mr. Jankowski. Uh, I, uh, I would agree with your final assessment there. In in the fullness of time, uh, I hope we do have a very nice, efficient uh, busing service that uh, serves all the region. Um, thank you. Thank you. If you have any closing comments. No, I just want to thank very much, uh, Council, for your attention. And uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, the, the town manager, um, Tom Golden, and uh, in particular, Mel Melanie Sampson, for all of the help over the course of the last number of uh, months as we've started the activity of preparing for opening day service in 2023. Uh, both, uh, both people have been instrumental in terms of uh, working through how we're going to approach this uh, as we go forward. So thank you for that. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Um, we will just keep on trucking along. Actually, you know what? It's 7 o'clock. We'll take uh, 15 minutes for uh, a break.
And we're back. So I think uh, William usually has something witty to say at this point, but I do not. So we will just jump right back into it. 4.4, uh, we have a presentation from uh, the Development Trends presentation. Oh, the UDI fellows. I don't have a name, but we'll jump into it. Welcome. Good evening, uh, members of the Governance and Priorities Committee at uh, Stony Plain. It's really nice to meet you virtually. My name is Kaylin Anderson, and I'm the director of the Urban Development Institute for the Edmonton region. With me today is Jamie Kitlarchuk, chair of the Stony Plain UDI Regional Committee, and he's also a project manager with Qualico Communities. The Urban Development Institute is a nonprofit association representing the land development industry across our region and as an industry enabling diversity a uh, great diversity of residential and non-residential development that meets a broad range of needs while supporting local and regional policy objectives is a key area of focus for us therefore our, our goal is always to support the communities that we serve by providing the diversity of homes and amenities that residents are looking for at its core, the work that you do as town council to govern and guide, the work that administration does to bring your vision to life, and the work that the private sector undertakes to bring uh, to build the new neighborhoods uh, that create that reality on the ground, it's all about building better places for people and ensuring that families and communities prosper. So really it is in working together and by supporting each other's success, we can create welcoming and competitive municipalities that support local, regional and provincial success in turn. And I think uh, based on the previous conversations, uh, that message has really come through. With the recent completion of the town's housing strategy, administration reached out to us to see if we would be interested and available to provide a, a very quick sort of overview of some of the land development trends that we're seeing throughout the region, not only in your community, particularly as it pertains to housing. So we are really pleased to be here and to be able to provide you with our insights because we do value the partnership that we have with your community and with others in the uh, Edmonton Metro region. So with that brief introduction, I will hand things over to Jamie to provide some insights and examples of where the housing market is trending um, in the rest of the region and in your community. And after his presentation, Jamie, myself, or Len Walters, who's here with Coventry Homes and uh, uh, here on behalf of the Canadian Home Builders Association, any, any of the three of us would be very pleased to answer your questions. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, thanks, Kaylin. Um, just before I get going, I just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen. I was kind of flipping between a couple of things here. I believe we can, says Market Trends. Good, perfect, perfect, thanks. Um, yeah, so as Kaylin mentioned, my name is Jamie Kitlarchuk, and I, in addition to chairing the UDI Stony Plain Regional Committee, I'm also a project manager with Qualico Communities. Uh, we're currently developing the communities of West Era, South Creek, and Silverstone, and have a few other areas planned for future development within the town. Over the next few slides, I'll provide some insight onto some, on some of the market trends that are seeing great success in the region, and identify some opportunities that are currently missing in the Stony Plain market. By far, the biggest gap we're seeing in Stony Plain is the, is the ability to develop lower density housing options that are more affordable than the typically larger lots that are seen in town. Specifically, narrower single detached housing has become increasingly popular throughout the, the Edmonton region, and our desire would be to see this opportunity enabled in Stony Plain. There are so, several factors that go into the price of a lot and consequently the price of a home. Other than land cost, servicing which includes length of pipe uh, length of road sidewalks boulevards etc has the highest impact on the cost providing the option for reduced lot widths would result in more efficient use of land and infrastructure a reduction in the town's per lot operational and maintenance costs to provide provide ownership options at lower price points and uh, provide an improvement to overall affordability for home buyers an observation that we see at the entry level is the majority of buyers are very price sensitive and tend to value the opportunity to get into a single family home over additional yard space. In recent years, we've experienced a loss in market share to places such as Spruce Grove, Leduc and West Edmonton, 
which all enable a more compact forms of single family housing. In fact, the diagram here illustrates what is currently permitted in Stony Plain on the top um, versus what we would typically develop on the same type of block right next door in Spruce Grove on the bottom. And you can see the difference in, in product type uh, and sorry, and the, the, the difference in lot width, uh, which which ultimately provides more options there. This puts Stony Plain at a competitive disadvantage as we're simply not able to provide the options that some buyers are looking for. Allowing for more compact development will address some of the gaps we are seeing and hopefully help to attract more buyers to the town. Reduced setback and zero lot line developments have also been hugely successful in the region and are currently permitted in several municipalities. While zero lot line is commonly referred to as a housing type, it really should be considered more of a tool that can be implemented through the zoning and design standards to allow a house to either be constructed with a reduced setback or directly on a property line. Zero lot line can essentially be looked at as a duplex split into two individual houses with each house located directly on its own property line. From the street, the built form looks exactly the same as a typical single family house. The difference is that there may be a reduced setback or reduced setback space between houses, which requires additional fire protection on the sidewalls. I should clarify, however, that zero lot line does not always mean that the space between houses is reduced. It may simply it may simply be a matter of shifting the house to one side to allow for a more usable wider side yard on the opposite side. The reason that this type of housing has been so successful and is increasing in popularity are similar to that of narrow of the more narrower compact housing shown on the previous slide. The key though is that zero lot line or reduced setback housing have typically been developed as single detached housing forms. This type of development has gained popularity over more traditional lower price point options such as duplexes due to its relatively similar price point with the desired feature of not having to not having a shared party wall. We also can't ignore the fact that New developments are required to hit a minimum density target, which is mandated by the EMRB and the town through its municipal development plan. We found that the Stony Plain market prefers single family housing to attached housing. So if we need to provide a slightly more dense option to align with overarching policies and density targets, zero lot line and narrower lots are well positioned options. That doesn't mean you'll no longer see duplexes or townhouses or larger lot options. It simply provides an alternative. Which leads me to the next slide. Smaller fee simple non condominium row housing has been one of the best selling products in several of our Edmonton communities. Many buyers, <clears throat> many buyers at this price point are not interested in condo living or paying condo fees and this development offer or this development type offers a similarly priced option on privately owned lots. These are extremely popular with first time buyers due to the price point, which competes with apartments and townhouse condos. You'll typically see them built on shallower lots, which may not have a rear yard, but will provide amenity space via larger front yards and balconies. Secondary suites have also been gaining popularity in recent years. There are a number of reasons for this. For homeowners, they can be used as income generators or mortgage helpers to help offset the cost of home ownership. They can also be used to accommodate extended family or multi-generational households and facilitate aging in place. Suites can provide downsizing opportunities, allow for live-in caregivers, and provide flexibility for homeowners to adapt to changing lifestyle needs over the course of their lives. They also benefit renters by increasing the stock of affordable renting op rental options, and they benefit municipalities through increased assessment values, more efficient use of municipal infrastructure, and what we would consider a more gentle form of increased density, which again aligns with the overarching policy goals and density targets. The last trend that I'd like to showcase is park or amenity fronting lots. Essentially, these types of lots are developed directly in front of a park space or a greenway where you would typically uh, see a roadway splitting the two. This has a number of benefits in that it provides direct access to public amenities, which reduces the need for larger private yards and reduces infrastructure costs by eliminating a roadway. It also results in more eyes on the park, which is an, an important safety design consideration. 
These are typically developed on shorter blocks to minimize the distance to on-street parking, which is accommodated along the side of lots and along the side of the park. While this type of development is not typically seen on a larger scale, it is a unique option that we are seeing more of as a community design feature. To wrap up, we believe that Stony Plain is poised to grow, and as an industry, we consider ourselves to be partners in building your community. It's for this reason that we encourage you to consider the benefits that we that we are or, sorry, the benefits of what we have presented today and set the course to allow for these options to be developed in Stony Plain. The tool that has the greatest impact on many of the items that I spoke of is the town's land use bylaw, which provides specific development regulations for all forms of development. Administration has been drafting updates that we believe will enable diversity of development that meets a broad range of needs while supporting local and regional policy objectives. We appreciate that there can be some ap apprehensions with any change in how land has been previously developed. However, the options I presented are simply that, options. They do not eliminate the need to develop more traditional options as well. In a, in a well-rounded community, there'll still be a market for everything for from larger estate houses to studio apartments. Thank you for the opportunity to provide information on some of the industry standards currently, currently being developed across the Edmonton region and provide some insight on where Stony Plain may have some opportunities to expand its housing options. We appreciate your continued partnership and thank you for the opportunity to work together. Uh, and with that, I will welcome any questions. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for that presentation. Uh, it's very informative. Um, <clears throat> opening it to council. Any questions? Councillor Hansard. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. One question I'd like to ask in your written presentation that we had in our council package, there was mention made of um, like st stacked apartments, if I'm not mistaken, but not condominiumized. Could you help us understand a little clearer how does, I don't know if these are strictly for rent or would they be ownership? And if they're ownership, how is that handled? And who takes care of the exterior of the building, the parking lot, snow removal, and all of those things? Sure, thanks for the question, Councillor Hansard. And I believe you're referring, if you don't mind, I could pull up my screen and, and uh, go back to um, that option, or I can just chat about it. But those specifically uh, were, were not stacked. So those those are a more typical type of um, townhouse option. But I'll pull up my screen and, and kind of run you through it here, if that's all right. Yep. So if we go back, um, this is what we're what we're referring to here, and what these are are actually three story, um, three three story. Tradi what you would consider a traditional row house on a fee simple lot. So, each of these units, um, each of these doorways is that's on the ground level would be a three story, um, fee simple unit. So, if I go to this slide here. This shows an example of what these look like from above. Uh, and you could see each of them is on its own titled parcel, just like a typical um, street oriented row house. But these particular ones being three stories, um, the garage itself is is basically on the ground level. And then the two living um, the, the two living spaces are on the second and third floor. And the amenity space, ra rather than having a rear yard, again, these uh, if, if we're looking at this, these would be the ones fronting against the park here. The, um, they'll, they'll typically have a larger front yard and um, either front or rear balconies that would make up the amenity space. And again, these are marketed really more towards uh, folks who, who you know, want their own fee simple unit, but don't necessarily want or have time to deal with maintenance of, of a backyard and a front yard and all of that. So they're 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 pretty compact um i guess with that does that does that sort of answer your question there's no it, need for it does for I additional thought, condo it does thank you i thought i had seen like an apartment building and i don't i never can understand how you have ownership but no condo fees on something like that so i think you've clarified you're talking stack houses very small footprint 
and uh, you own the piece of the planet that your home is built on. Is that That's correct? That's exactly it. Yeah, every one of those three-story units would be within one of these purple boxes shown on here. So each of these purple uh, rectangles is an individually owned lot. Um, it's, it's similar to if you have a duplex again or a, or a standard row house on a fee simple lot. Okay, and I, I just have a comment to Mr. Deputy yeah, Mayor. Please. I really appreciate your presentation because it does open the door for us to understand different ways of looking at housing. One of the things that I find interesting, I just talked to a gentleman at a meeting this last week who was telling me uh, that he felt that we had too many options for housing in Stony, and that he did not want to see small lot, skinny lot, um, anything smaller than what we've already got. And I didn't bring up the subject, he just came out of the blue. He really wants to see larger lots, and I'm going, oh my goodness, he must not be at all with the understanding of what's needed in society, how you make housing more affordable, and two, um, that the, we're mandated to a large extent for greater density, so how do we get that? And his comment really surprised me all of Stony Plain, not just the neighborhood. He does not like integrated housing like in Graybar. This person lives in Graybar. And he does not like to see where we've got all kinds of housing. So of course, I, I left the subject. I wasn't going to engage him there. We were there for another purpose. But I think we've got a certain stigma to uh, try to maybe turn the tide on when it comes to adopting some new ways of looking at housing. Your uh, report is, is very good. It gives us some information so that we can talk to people like this because we're not a large lot, large home, single family community anymore. We're not, we can't call that sustainability and it's not affordable. And the last thing is, when you allow suites, garage suites and so forth, and um, you, you make two affordable houses, the one, the home that the buyer buys because they then have an income. And in today's world in financing, uh, you're allowed to count the rent of one of those rentable suites 100% as if it was an income to help you offset the mortgage. Uh, so to qualify for your mortgage. So it's good to see these things come forward in a way more formal way than I was trying to explain it to this particular gentleman. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. For those comments, Councillor Hansard. Um, we'll go to our virtual uh, Councillor Laurie to start with. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and I just wanted to thank our presenters today for the information that they presented. Um, not really much of a question, um, more so just some comments. I've been paying attention to the UDI reports, particularly over the last couple of years, and it's been very interesting to see uh, what I would call the limited number of builders and developers that have been working in Stony Plain versus, as was mentioned, you know, right next door and generally other communities in the Edmonton metro region. So uh, I'm very appreciative of seeing these options come forward. and. You know, I really want to thank you because I think, uh, as Councillor Hansard mentioned, there's there's a lot of myths I would call them out there, and having uh, having this presentation, having this information in this public session that we can utilize to help dispel those myth those myths is a is a great thing, as well as showing some of the unique opportunities. Um, you know, like the park front lots. That's something I'd never actually really thought of before. I'd seen that type of housing before, not but not necessarily as a park front lot. And, you know, when you talk about the ability to take that and do that on a smaller parcel of land, but still give them something equivalent to a yard and hey, who doesn't like the bonus of not having to cut that grass themselves. So, you know, it's, it's great to see some of those things in there. Um, you know, a, a huge thing that I've heard um, both this past election and the election before was more of an outweighing voice of people who are looking for Stony Plain to 
become increasingly accessible and affordable for people. It's a desirable community for many people, both young and old. It's a desirable community for people to start growing their family. And one of the biggest things I've heard over the last while is I can buy a house cheaper in Spruce Grove. I want to stay in Stony, but I can buy a house cheaper in Spruce Grove. And unfortunately, we're gone are the days of the boom and we are now in the bust where the almighty dollar is unfortunately a much higher ranking on the decision maker for people lately. So, you know, it's great to see this come forward. I think like I said, we're in the midst of a bit of a generational shift in, in what people are looking for in housing. And so again, just thank you very much for the presentation tonight. The information is incredibly valuable and I look forward uh, to seeing some of the potential changes in our land use bylaw and how that may allow us to do some of these things. Thank you, Councillor Laurie. Um, just going to Mayor Choi, uh, you had your hand up earlier. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. It was very informative and definitely appreciated uh, to see where we're trending in terms of development industry. Let me just question for um, the presenters. Uh, in the past, uh, we've talked to quite a few individuals in our community that are moving out of our community because they cannot find the housing type that they're looking for. And what they're looking for is a uh, single story, 900 to 1,000 square foot bungalow, which has, you know, main floor laundry for a couple of seniors. And I know at least half a dozen residents that have moved out of Stony Plain because they cannot find that project here. And you tell me that, you know, when we had this conversation before, the trend was for two stories. Yeah. But is a trend for two stories because that's all we're building based on lot size, you know, based on what's more economic feasible for developers to build versus what, what the actual need is. Because if you build two stories in every community, well, that's that's the demand because that's all that there is for sale. If you built, you know, 1,000 square foot bungalows in the community and that's all that's selling, well, that's the demand because that's all that's offered. So how do we address that? Because I've you know what, our residents are really good and I'm losing that segment of our population that want to stay here, but they can't. Hey, Your Worship, maybe I'll take a first crack at it and uh, then pass it over to Jamie. Um, I think you make an excellent point um, that it's not just about building for different house, house prices, but also for different um, ages and stages of life. So the pictures that Jamie showed about the park fronting lots would, I think, be quite ideal for potentially people with, with young kids who they could just watch them run out uh, into the, the basically the front yard, which is extended. Um, but there's also a lot of other needs. I was recently in Fort Saskatchewan and there's some really um, interesting development that was happening. Um, it was called uh, no barrier housing, where there was like no threshold to get in and there were no stairs throughout. And I just thought that was a really, really thoughtful um, way of dealing with that issue of mobility and being able to stay in one's home for a long time and also reducing the amount of, of space that's required. So I would say before I hand it over to Jamie that um, if there are more opportunities, the best the best thing that I guess as a regulatory body that, that I would recommend to you is to enable that development to happen and just to make sure that there's no barriers to it in your in your uh, land use bylaw. Uh, and then, um, you know, through conversations with, with your community and with the developers who are active in your community, I think really addressing that market gap uh, is critical because um, to an earlier point, um, you know, we really are here to help build uh, thriving communities um, across the region and for all segments uh, of your population. And with that, I was going to hand it to Jamie, but I do see that Len, who is our home builder, uh, would actually like to pop in. So if you don't mind, I'll pass the mic to Len. Thank you. Um, Mayor Choi, um, to answer your question, uh, in our, our businesses uh, with CHBA, we do see a lot of generational housing. Um, one of the things that, that is key for a lot of people is um, that with the secondary suites, we're, we're seeing a lot where the parents are actually deciding to live in the basement. Um, and actually the children are living in the upper two floors with their new family. Uh, grandparents are close. Um, financially, it just makes a lot, lot of sense for both parties. And of course, that close bond to the family. And we're finding that is keeping a lot of people moving where their children wish to build. Um, and 
your community having the great walking paths and, and family environment, um, I think would make a great choice for that option. I, I can um, I can also provide maybe some insight there, uh, Mayor Choi, on on the bungalow um, on the bungalow conversation because um, the majority of lots that are serviced um, can actually accommodate bungalows, so there's nothing that would prevent uh, a buyer or a builder from building a bungalow. Um, there, there would be nothing to prevent a buyer from going to any builder in any neighborhood and requesting a bungalow on a specific lot. Uh, the, the difficulty, I, I think, is that often buyers um, who are looking for that, what they would consider maybe a, um, a downsizing option, th that brand new bungalow on a new lot in a new neighborhood actually costs more than the house that they're moving out of would sell for. And so there's a there's often a bit of a sticker shock there. Um, but also there seems to be there's it is definitely much more efficient to build a two story home. So when you're talking about a, a 900 square foot bungalow, that same 900 square foot bungalow would be 1800 square feet on two stories, right? Uh, your basement cost, your foundation cost is going to be the same. Your roof cost is going to be the same. So now it's just the interior. Some of the the largest costs, and Len can correct me if I'm wrong, but in terms of uh, the, the price of a home are going to be your concrete foundation, your roofing cost, and that sort of thing. So that's why it, it there there are some efficiencies in building at two stories. But that's not to say that that's the only option. Um, one of the things that we do see in our neighborhoods is is that, you know, you, you will get the odd bungalow built, but it might be like less than 5% of, of houses in new neighborhoods are built as bungalows. I, I don't know the actual number, but I'm just thinking dri myself driving through. It's probably closer to, to 1% or 2%. And, and the reality is there's there's nothing stopping anyone from, from building one. It's just that that's not what... what um, majority of, of buyers uh, who are buying um, are, are, you know, requesting from builders. So um, I don't know if that necessarily answers the question as to, you know, what can be done. But I, I think as Kaylin mentioned, it, it's a matter of providing the, the options and the opportunities. And, and I think that Stony Plain does, does have those options. It's just uh, re really what it comes down to is is um, a buyer's expectations and and what they're willing to to um, you know design with a builder I guess okay. thank you for those those answers and that's a good conversation piece to continue to have uh, another question for our presenters is uh, in terms of um, reducing the, the cost for residents to move in um, you know, we'll always talk about 40% uh, lot coverage and it wasn't covered here, but is there any benefits of maybe increasing that to say a 50% or 60% lot coverage? Um, but with that caveat that it has to be a generational home so that, you know, the parents are there or the in-laws are there with, with the family. So it kind of creates community. So it strengthens the family ties, but it also adds additional living quarters. And then also then, you know, covering the lot at 55% or 60% is a lot more environmental friendly than 40%. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get, again kick it off, Your Worship. Um, so you can definitely tie, I've seen this happen in other communities and certainly in Edmonton, you can tie the number of units to larger site coverage if you want to, to allow more to be built um, or to allow the, um, the cost to be reduced. The challenge that you might have is that your land use bylaw can only regulate the type of use that it gets put to, not the user. So you wouldn't be able to say specifically that um, this type of housing is for a certain segment of your population, but uh, really take your point that if there's an opportunity for 
uh, a couple of different units within uh, one housing configuration that truly is designed to enable multi-generational housing, that one of those trade-offs might be um, that you uh, allow more site coverage so that the cost of the lot is lower and more house can be built. Uh, we've certainly seen that in, in, in the region. Okay, well, thank you for that. And I appreciate that because I believe that if it is multi-generational housing, then you can reduce the number of vehicles as well as the parents can share vehicles and therefore you have um, people to assist with raising the family. I think it just builds a stronger family unit, but um, we need to be able to have, like I said, if lots are getting smaller, then we need to actually increase the lot coverage to be able to accommodate that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Choi. Uh, moving to Councillor Pelechko. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Karen and Jamie, for tonight's presentation. I just, I'm just i looking for a little bit of clarification because I'm, I'm feeling uh, very perplexed by this proposal that I've seen tonight. And the reason I'm feeling that is, is urban developments a subsidiary of Qualico Homes? Sorry, are you talking about the Urban Development Institute, Councillor? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, no, we're not. Um, the Urban Development Institute represents over 160 uh, different member companies across the whole region. Um, Qualico is a member, but it's one of 160. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, and the reason I asked that question is the first half of this presentation, I felt I was being presented to by Qualico and what works best for them in the development of a community that moves them forward, which has me a bit concerned. When I read this report, I felt very good about the report. I thought it was a good opportunity for us to look for different ways to move our community forward. And yet the first half of this was very specific that this would work for Qualico in, in different areas. It works in the communities that they're building in. So what my question really is, how do we move Stony Plain forward? Let's take Qualico out of this picture and move developers into our community that makes Stony Plain unique. I don't want to be the same as Spruce Grove down the road. We are nothing alike. We are two different communities and we need to build different product within our community. I really like what Mayor Troy was talking about. That was one of my questions was more development on small on a lot. So bigger home on a lot, maybe lower. Uh, single family, that type of thing. Something geared towards seniors, that type of thing. That's a big thing that's really talked about within our community is how do we get the elderly into homes and yet look after them so they don't have grass to cut, they don't have sidewalks to clean and that type of thing and yet still have it so they can call it their home. And yet today, the first part of this development is really about what's good in other communities that makes the developer more money. And I don't know that that's a really important thing. I understand that it's important for developers to make money, and I can appreciate that in every community. But I do think that this U the UDI Institute is about moving communities forward and what works best within our community. So I'm hoping that uh, we can get the second part of this presentation kept that out. It went to suites, it went to a number of things which I was really excited about. And, uh, and I'm just wondering how we can incorporate this within to our community because Stony Plain is unique and we hear over and over and over, we don't want small zero lot lines. And I get that that's a myth of what a small zero lot line looks like, but it is a very large conversation that we have within our community when we walk through this community. And I've walked this community for about 14 years now, and every time I hear the same thing. So it's not always for the, for the residents, it's about what's good for Stony Plain. It's unique, it's how we build our community. It's not, and I understand that it's important that we have developers and builders to move forward, and I have several conversations with the builders that we have here too, which struggle with a little bit of what we don't have. So, how do we just move our community forward to get to the point where we have some unique stuff that, Stone, that Spruce Grove doesn't have that brings that clientele here that helps to move our community forward? Thank you. It's a terrific question. It's completely on point with, uh, I think, what every community desires. 
we all live in a big family in this Edmonton region, of course, but within the family, we're all very unique and people will move to different parts of our region for different reasons. So in terms of your community's vision for how it wants to see itself, I think it's really about um, describing that really clearly and opening up a variety of different opportunities. When it comes to who's developing, I would say that part of it has to do with who's currently owning the land, but that's not to say that that's the, the constant state forever. I mean, development's very dynamic. There are about probably 15 different major development companies who are active within the region and in different parts. Um, and some of them um, are more active in um, the communities outside of Edmonton and some of them only develop within Edmonton. So um, I would say that having a really great strong vision for the future of what you want to see, whether it's your, your downtown, how your uh, older neighborhoods might redevelop a little bit over time or how your new suburban communities are going to build out is really critical and your housing strategies are a really good first step. Uh, so I think you're on the right track. Um, I do see Len again, so I'll play the, the traffic control and invite him in uh, if that's okay, Councillor, just from a home building perspective. Yeah, for sure. I just, uh, just to add to that a tiny bit, when I see the narrow compact housing, it adds one, basically it went from 14 to 15. How big a difference does that really make on the end result? Because you, we're talking profit and dollars for a lot. So if we're selling a hundred grand for a lot, we, we downsize that by one lot in correlation to 15 opposed to 14. It doesn't drastically reduce the price. And yet we talk about affordable housing. How do we get the affordable housing to be affordable? So I'm, I'm excited to hear what uh, Len has to say as well. Thank you. <clears throat> so, so as far as developers, it is who owns the land there. And, and yes, Colco does own a large portion of the land. I know there are many developers who are looking at opportunities to develop land in other areas. Um, and obviously the product that they can build is one of the biggest things that is a challenge for them. Um, it doesn't necessarily save them cost. It does enable them to produce one more lot, maybe in that row of 15. But the uh, other part of the presentation that, that I guess we're looking at is when you start looking at those front yard homes or secondary suites, now you've taken that 15 lots and turned it into 25 residences. Um, among those lots, which, which obviously um, helps your economy just in growth and, and having um, sustainable employees for you know all positions. Um, all, all sorts of different things have come from this. Um, you know, as much as UDI is a member of 160 builders, uh, CHBA Edmonton um, or CHBA Alberta has hundreds of members, not only builder members, but also trade and supplier members. Um, and obviously we're all in this together. Um, this isn't more of an opportunity far as making more profit per lot. It is more of an opportunity of being able to do more in your community. Um, and that, that is really where, where the, I guess, profit growth, all those things that we talk about lie. As much as it is a profit for a builder or a developer to move their product, um, you know, it is way more profitable for, for you to have residents in your community contributing to your community. Um, so I, I hope that takes it away from being more of a, a developer or a Qualico presentation. Uh, UD, I mean, Jamie um, is obviously, you know, the chair of UDI because they are such a large developer and do have such an invested um, interest in that industry. Um, so is does that help um, or is there anything else that, that I could answer for you? No, thank you, Len. I think uh, that answers uh, what I was looking for. Again, it goes back to the second half of the presentation, which really talked about how we can increase stuff for our community by doing more with what we have. So I, I do appreciate the, the fact uh, of where you're coming from. Thanks, Len. Any other questions? Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and uh, thank you for uh, your presentation today. Um, I appreciated uh, Mayor Choi and Councillor Palachko's thoughts on this, actually. Uh, we had a presentation um, a couple of weeks ago here where we looked at our demographic and the need uh, in our community. 
And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was over 60% of households are one and two person households uh, in our community uh, with a need of um, you know, over 500 two bedroom homes and over 800 senior, senior housing units. And, you know, when I look at the trends, and I'm going to take this as maybe a trend, not a recommendation for us, um, it is a lot of single detached, um, which typically would have, you know, more than two bedrooms, right? And so, you know, my wonder, I guess, and, and I think this echoes Councillor Pelechko's question, but, you know, how do we integrate? Um, you know, the need to maintain or keep our residents that are already here and balance that uh, with looking for new growth based on the trends that we're seeing. Again, it's a great question. Uh, you know, for almost 8 p.m. On a, on, a, on a Monday, I'm very impressed <laughs> with the level of questions, and I hope I can try to keep up with you. Um, to meet your housing need, um, what I would say is there's a difference between um, what people want in terms of good attainable housing and what's um, truly affordable in the market right now. And I say that because in some of the markets within the region, and I don't know if this is the case or not in Stony Plain, so I'll just give you a more holistic point of view. Um, a small single detached house uh, for a one or two person household especially if you're considering different factors, like perhaps um, some folks are single parents or they're on one salary, um, that's not an affordable um, housing type for them anymore. So the way that this is being met, the, need, the needs being met in other parts of the region is through um, more sort of multifamily types of housing, whether they're uh, townhouses um, or um, stacked row housing. That would have to align with, with your town plan, of course, and what you want to see in terms of development. But it's, um, it, you know, I, I would say, Councillor, it's really about trying to truly meet that housing need, um, maybe maybe even over, over and above what the form is, uh, because what you want is for your community to feel um, like they can not only uh, have a good sustainable quality of life in terms of the investment that they're making and what they're paying for, but you also want to be able to continue to attract a wide diversity of, of folks into your community, whether it's um, uh, residents who are able to afford very large estate lots, that's part of the demographic, or maybe younger families or uh, smaller uh, households who are not able to afford the same um, type of housing, but who nonetheless should have really appropriate and dignified um, accommodation in Stony Plain. The, the, Thank you for that. Sorry, you have another one? No, that's good. That's good. Uh, Council Lines. So based upon, sorry, what you just said about finding what our needs are, Mayor Choi just said our needs were the bungalow style smaller homes spread out on a lot so there's less grass. If that's what our need is, but you're showing again the trends that that's not the trend, how is it we can move forward with these trends, your recommendations, if we're saying that this is what we require? Yeah, thank you for that. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll start again and I'll, I'll let uh, maybe Jamie answer. It's not that those needs can't be met in terms of physically building the houses that people want it's is that truly an affordable way of building a home so if you're building a two-story home for that's 1800 square feet for four hundred thousand dollars just for argument's sake or you're building a bungalow for 900 square feet for um, three hundred seventy five thousand um, dollars that might not be a huge differential um, in terms of like that affordability and Further, as people go to the bank for loans, uh, their bank might ask questions about why um, why they're not maximizing their, their development. So it's really about anything can be built, Councillor. It's just a matter of do people want to pay for that um, type of housing? And uh, truthfully, the, the, the smaller scale housing still has to have the same infrastructure that's, you know, put into the neighborhood design, et cetera, et cetera. They're still paying for the lot. So there's a lot of really sunk costs that are fixed. Um, with that, I see Len has put up his hand again, so he's probably here to save me or to uh, further elaborate. So I'll pass the mic. Thank you. Um, so going back to the needs um, of your community, um, 
currently, if you ask everybody uh, who is there, most of the demographics that is there is the larger homes, single family lots, um, larger lots. Um, we have a saying in Edmonton here, and a lot of this is on the infill, um, is NIMBYs, so not in my backyard. Um, and that, that typically seems to be any demographics going, what do you think about some other demographics? They they don't seem to feel that there is a, a need or a want for it. Um, more so probably a want than a need. Um, from the builder community, um, we do a wide variety of product. Um, the reason we do that is so that we can actually produce more product, sell more homes um, in communities. Stony Plain is one of my less productive communities simply for the reason that the product line there is limited as to what I, I can sell. Um, so, I, I mean, it may not be a want. Um, you know, you have a report on what the demographics requires there. Um, and I think that's kind of what you need to say, okay, what kind of housing do we need? Do we need where we have multi-generational or do we need a little more densification, you know, a little less yard upkeep um, in order for your town to grow um, and sustain itself? So I, I just sort of want, you know, I'm sure it's not probably the answer you wanted, but I'm, I think it sort of answers the question. Okay, I'm just to kind of throw it out there. I currently live in a bungalow. Uh, we bought it several years ago and we bought it for under 300,000. We have one of the larger lots in our area and we back onto a playground. So to say a two story that costs 400 versus a bungalow, which is gonna cost you three something, isn't necessarily the truth fact either. Cause like I just said, I bought my home for under 300. So if I could just speak to that, Jamie, if you don't mind. Um, if, you, if you were to buy that that two story for 400 and be able to have a revenue suite in it um, and be able to have your mortgage for less than your three hundred thousand dollar mortgage that you had paid for uh, with all the same amenities um, could you see how that could be more attractive to a larger demographics of people it could be in the sense of wanting to have that I'm a mom with three kids happily married so five of us wanting to share a dwelling with somebody else probably isn't practical, but that's my own personal life here. But I can't speak for everybody in this world. And, and, and that's the, the key to the market that we deal with is that we try to appeal to the masses more than just one demographic. So I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Count, uh, sorry, Jamie, are you going to respond? Yes, I'd like to because this seems to be a really important uh, piece of the conversation here. And um, I just just one question, I guess, for a counselor. You mentioned you purchased a, um, a bungalow. Was that a resale bungalow or, or did you build that bungalow? Was that a brand new home? No, it was a resale. So that's part it was of the only difference, right? five years old. Like the people were. I, I appreciate that. And that, that's part of the difference here is that um, there are there are going to be resale bungalows available at that price point, but but in a, in in a newer neighborhood, we're what we're really dealing with here is a brand new house, right? And housing costs have increased substantially over the last number of years. So have infrastructure costs, um, and that all plays into the cost of a new home. So it, there's there's going to be that that price differential there, and so you know if if you five years ago bought a house that was five years old for $300,000. That house today is probably worth more than $300,000. Um, and if I were to, to um, look at a house now that's only five years old, there, there'd also be that price gap, that price difference there. Uh, the, I think that the, the difficulty here is, is where is this type of thing comes up a lot where there seems to be this this um, desire for um, for folks at a certain point to downsize, and and you know they want to to get into a, a bungalow, um, and the reality is that the cost of building a new bungalow in a new neighborhood is more per square foot than building a two-story home in a new neighborhood, um, which is okay. There's still some people who who. 
um, you know, have no issue with that and they'll they'll choose to to go that route. But on the flip side, um, you know, just I guess what I'm hearing is that is that we is that narrow, narrower or more compact lots are concerning because that might um, attract a certain demographic. And what we're trying to do here is is really um, provide options for, for a different demographic. I think what, what we were trying to present here today is just at a, at a high level in the region, what is the most successful and where there is the most demand and where there are missing opportunities. And I, based on the land use bylaw and, and the policies in place in Stony Plain right now, I don't think that a lot of work needs to be done to enable what you're speaking about when we talk about, um, you know, bungalows on, on smaller lots with more site coverage. I think we're almost there. But I think there's a disconnect between what's allowed and what it actually costs and what people are willing to pay for that. And and that's where the where where there's going to be a bit of a challenge because there's nothing that we can do to reduce the cost, the ever inflating cost of material and labor. Um, that brand new bungalow is not going to be close to the price of a 10 year old or older bungalow. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Loins. Uh, Councillor Hansard. Now? Yes, please. Okay. I just want to make sure. So I'm a realtor, and I've been doing this for about 20 years, and I, I appreciate very much that Qualico came to help build our town. And many who have sat on council with me will say, we have to be grateful for those who came to help us build our town. What I want to say is, if 90% if of what is built is two stories, and 10% are bungalows or bi-levels, which have less stairs in one direction. Down the road, not even that many years, a few years later, a lot of years later, the trend will be for builders to tell us the most popular home to build is two stories because they, more of them sell. But listen, the reason more of them sell is because that's the bulk of what was built. So I do believe you hit uh, uh, one of the nails on the head when you say what's allowed, what is allowed. There is no way you are going to build bungalows at, unless you've got a bigger lot or you're going to allow different setbacks for bungalows. It's not just a matter of a 900 square foot bungalow versus a uh, an 800 square foot two story that you can also have another 800 square feet on. Uh, frankly, a 900 square foot two story is a big house. That's a pretty big house. So here's my thought. Every time I've sat on MPC or SDAB or council and builders used to come to before council to air what they wanted to do, I would ask, will you build some bungalows? And I was always told, we were told, council, there's no market for it because it costs more. You have to have bigger lots. The home footprint is bigger. And the setbacks force you to have a bigger lot. So people pay more for the lot. And the materials to build are not just more basement and more roof. The amount of walls is more. The roofs are bigger for sure. The amount of basement flooring is bigger. So it's a very expensive enterprise to build a bungalow. And yet, that is very demanding. From 20 years ago, when I first sat on council, the demand for this has gotten exponentially larger. We need bungalows. I've got, I've, I've got currently 890 and 900 square foot bungalows, but I hear all the time, these aren't quite big enough. A thousand square foot bungalow. So what do we do? I like one of your suggestions. We move move over toward one side of the lot to allow a bigger a bigger space. And the key to me, a bungalow definition of a bungalow, you could put lots of words with it, but it's everything you need for daily living on one level. 
That's what people are looking for. Unless the builders build them, we will never know for years to come that people really do want more of them because they aren't available to prove in the marketplace that they will sell and that there's a demand. So we need to provide them. Spruce Grove is building them of all sizes. And like Mayor Choi said, we're losing our people to Spruce Grove, people we want to keep here. Many of them have lived here for many years. So I like the idea that you've approached that we could build bungalows, but we have to have we have to have different uh, definitions of what's allowed in order to do that. And then the developers need to not make a fortune on the lot because it's a little bit bigger. We need to, if we're going to talk affordable, we've got to find a way to make it affordable to build the bungalows. And no, not everybody is wanting the 1,500, 1,600, 1,250 square foot bungalow. Get, let me find one for a thousand square feet and I'd love, love to move into it. I could sell those all day long like cookies at a bake sale. The problem is we don't have them. They're not available because nobody built them in years past and really nobody's building them now. I think that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hansard. Um, I'm not sure if there was a question there. Well, there was a lot there. There it was a lot. It just I'm, wasn't I'm just a question. It was not a question. Okay, so we, we won't make the UDI uh, guys uh, answer that. Um, but I do appreciate the, the comments for sure. Uh, just going uh, once more around the table, uh, if anybody has any comments. No, and I'm looking on screen, none of our virtual counselors either do. But uh, if we're all getting on our soapboxes, uh, I'm just kidding. Was that? That's. Did that you was, really say that? <laughs> maybe that was the wrong choice. Word. Mr. Deputy I apologize. Mayor, what I mean is, if we're going to get out here <laughs> and put forward our, our feelings on the matter, I too would also like to. Yes. Uh, and just to your your earlier comment, uh, Janie. Um, sorry, I really didn't mean that to be insulting or anything. I'm not insulting. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Your, to your comment earlier, Jamie, uh, in regards, I think a lot of people around this table um, certainly do, uh, I don't think there is necessarily an apprehension in regards to what kind of demographic uh, that we are going to bring into the town. I think there's, you've heard uh, sort of certainly this council uh, express sort of how we hold on to uh, uh, residents who have always made Stony Plain, Stony Plain, and how we kind of transition them through different phases of their life. And so my comment too is, is um, is in regards, I'm quite uh, taken by the front park, park fronting lots. Mm -hmm. To me that, that strikes uh, a really a good balance. I, I think it's very important, uh, certainly during these past two years with COVID and everything, uh, getting children a, a good place to, to play outside and, and experience the great outdoors, even if it is just a park, is important. Uh, and when I see um, smaller and smaller lot sizes, I certainly do appreciate the, uh, the uh, effect on the housing price that it can you know, help facilitate in that regard. Um, but I, I would like to hear how maybe you guys would see something like those front uh, park fronting Lots. I'm, uh, and how that would, uh, and the opportunities for those around Stony Plain. Sure, I can. I can try my best. Um, it's Councillor yeah. Meyer there, right? Yeah. Or I can't. Can't. Uh, I can only see a small blur on my screen. Um, yeah. So with that one again, that what we're seeing is this is more of a more of like a unique feature that that you know you're going to see it as on a smaller scale so a, say a block of of eight or ten lots it's not going to it's typically not seen on a larger scale where you have multiple blocks of this in the same neighborhood just because it is a very niche kind of product um, there are a few neighborhoods in edmonton where they they have essentially eliminated multiple blocks of, of local roads and and replace them with linear greenways and um, they're pretty pretty great um, pretty fun places to hang out but again it's it's they're in neighborhoods that are already very dense and there's 
I think a little bit more of um, more of an appetite and acceptance of, of that of like say having to walk half a block to your to your house and that sort of thing. So in terms of the Stony Plain context, um, where I could see this coming into play is, you know, if you've got a small pocket park, say in a new neighborhood, um, that's that's more of just a, a little, um, I don't know, a, a little landscaped kind of hangout area where you might, you know, put a, t- a towel down or something and read a book. Um, I could see it potentially in an area where you're fronting onto a stormwater management facility, uh, which could could provide some nice visual um, and aesthetic uh, benefits there, along with the 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 more um, like the recreational type of uh, uh, green space amenity. But I guess you know overall, it, there's there's nothing saying it couldn't be developed in in any neighborhood. Um, it's just it's something that I think in Stony Plain that if uh, if a developer were to um, to test it out, it would probably be on a small scale again, just because we know in Stony Plain parking is is a pretty important consideration for a lot of buyers. So um, you know there might be a little bit of uncertainty and and risk uh, regarding how well it's received, but. Um, I can't speak for other developers, but th- it's some something that we have considered in uh, one of our neighborhoods and um, in our Tussock area structure plan. Actually, we've identified a few areas for it. Now, that's a li- you know development of that is a little ways out, but you know we are thinking about this kind of thing as we're planning um, going forward uh, in, in our communities. Does that? Does that help at all? Uh, yes, it does. I'm. I'm. Uh, I wrote down pocket parks. So, um, and I like parks. So, those things go well together. Uh, anyhow, um, again, one more look around the table. Uh, I don't see any uh, more hands up. Uh, Kaylin, uh, Jamie, and uh, Len, I appreciate your guys' uh, um, presentation, and. Uh, and it's given, obviously, a voice to a lot of great conversation uh, this evening, too. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. So that was all our delegations. Thank you, Council, for uh, some good conversation there. Uh, we will move on to business items uh, 5.1, the annual development activity report. I imagine Edmund's going to present. Deputy Mayor, um, I believe our staff will make a quick presentation here too. And uh, just since I have the, the mic, I think you may have noticed our, our mayor is having connectivity uh, challenges. So he has been a little bit in and out, but uh, um, I believe now if we see his name up there on the screen, that means he's in the meeting. If, if not, that means he's trying to connect to the meeting. So I'll just turn it over to our staff to, for their presentation. Good evening, Council. Um, I bring you the development activity update for 2021. This is a quick overview. Uh, We're going to go through the definition of development, a quick overview of the land use planning framework and some development triggers. We'll go through the summary of the 2021 development activity, including pre-applications, subdivisions, development. Sorry, uh, if I could just interrupt. We're just having a little troubles uh, hearing hearing? you. If uh, maybe if you dropped your mask there, we'd. Not a problem. Is that better? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. So again, I'll, we'll go through an introduction here on the definition of development, uh, overview of the land use planning framework and some development triggers, and then we'll go through a summary of the 2021 development activity, including pre-applications, subdivisions, development permits, and development agreements, and go through the location of some development activity, and then a little bit of the areas to watch in 2022. So development can generally be defined as anything from an excavation to stockpiling, uh, building, this includes additions, replacements, and repairs of buildings, changes of use or intensity of land. This, for example, would be um, if you have a car dealership 
and they triple the amount of cars or the intensity that they're using um, is, is, again, a type of development per se. <clears throat> In terms of our land use planning framework in Stony Plain, uh, we go all the way from intermunicipal on the left side of the screen through municipal, kind of neighborhood level, down through land development and site development. And really, in terms of this report, we're reporting on what takes place at the land development and the site development scale. <clears throat> in terms of development triggers, uh, there's kind of high level down to uh, the detailed level. So at the high level, we have things like area structure plans, uh, area redevelopment plans, which are at the neighborhood level. And then things a little more uh, detailed wise, uh, redistricting is or commonly referred to as rezonings and changes to the land use bylaw, text changes, for example. And then we have kind of the, the meat of what we do in planning and development area, which is subdivisions, development permits, uh, building permits, endorsements for subdivisions, those sort of as aspects. In terms of a summary of what took place in 2021, um, kind of a new process that we just started two years ago was to actually track the amount of pre-applications we had. So we had a total of 36 this year. I believe there's about somewhere in the mid-20s last year, so we show a little uptake in that. Um, they're allocated between 20 planning inquiries, which again are kind of the higher levels, the rezonings and the area structure plans, and 16 at the development level. We had six conditional subdivision approvals taken place and a total of 10 endorsements. So basically every year, um, different approvals go for subdivisions and it's up to the developers to meet the conditions of those subdivision applications. Once those are met, we will endorse them. So often there's kind of a backlog of how many are there to be endorsed. Just shows that of the backlog, we actually processed a lot more to create new lots as opposed to approve potential future lots. And then in terms of the development permits, uh, 319 development permits were issued for new construction. And I'll just make a, a note here. So this is new construction. So greenfield sites, uh, new commercial buildings, industrial buildings, uh, the new Stony Plain Central, for example, is, is a new development, as opposed to things that are improvements, um, which consist of things for, um, say for example, they build a commercial building and there's nine bays. Well, every one of those bays will likely have another development approval for each individual bay when they construct that individual business. Those are not considered new construction. Those are considered tenant improvements, typically. Uh, things like basement renovations, um, additions, things like that are not necessarily considered the new ones. In terms of this here, we have 110 residential, uh, one commercial, one institutional, and the two industrial. The one institutional, for example, was the new Stony Plain Central School. And then um, another important part of development is actually the development agreements. So once a subdivision or development permit has been issued, if there's any municipal infrastructure that would be required to complement that, say new roads, uh, pipes, trails, sidewalks, anything to that extent, extent um, we would enter into a development agreement. So this shows that in terms of new infrastructure being created, there are six development agreements that will lead to new infrastructure being taken over by the town over time. In terms of the locations of the development activity, you can see here uh, Genesis on the Lakes, uh, West Terra, South Creek, Fairways North, Silverstone, Brickyard are kind of the new residential neighborhoods, along with Fairways North, just in um, kind of the Old Town area. And then north of the highway, we have North Industrial and the Gertz or RG Industrial. Again, there was one new industrial in each of those industrial parks. Um, in terms of Old Town, again, one of those was the new Stony Plain Central School. I would say the highlights are the South Creek, a uh, fair number there, Folkestone Villas. Again, these are a series of, um, call it a comprehensive site plan for row house units. So there's 24 in that area in Folkestone. And then uh, again, West Terra, there was a fair number that took place there as well. Again, areas to watch. Um, I know council's seen some of this information in more detail, but uh, as a general overview, these are the areas that we had predominantly new pre-applications for, or we have existing uh, subdivisions, development agreements, or um, a large number of new lots that, come in, that came online through uh, subdivisions. And again, we have the various information from Gertz Avenue. I'm just gonna flip through all of these here. And that leads us to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, administration. 
Um, opening it up to council for questions of clarity and understanding. Looking around. Oh, Councillor Laurie, go ahead. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and I just want to thank administration for the presentation. Uh, I've got a bit of a, a comment and a question here. So as I was reviewing this information, I'm looking on page 109 uh, of our council package, and it's uh, the development of building permits and the number of permitted dwelling units. So 2021 saw us at uh, 110 permitted dwelling units, which was a 31% reduction or decrease from uh, 2020. And it's also the third lowest year on record on that chart through 11 years. When we talk about the growth and sustainability of the town of Stony Plain, I'm wondering if administration can paint us a little bit of a picture in respect to, let's say, maintaining status quo and the growth Stony Plain needs to uh, needs to achieve just to keep status quo. So not improve, not uh, increasing any expenses, not increasing taxes, not doing any of that. So just inflation and, and general increases. What what percentage of growth? Does Stony Plain need to see in something like the building and development permits in order to be sustainable? Uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, thanks for the question through to Councillor Laurie. Um, yeah, it's a pretty big, broad question. So, you know, what sort of level of growth uh, would would sustain uh, Stony Plain going forward? Um, you know, in relation to these charts. Uh, you know, I would probably venture a guess that uh, we'd like to see those new permit numbers up a little bit higher than what they have been in the last couple of years. I think, uh, uh, you know, the, how that number translates into our operating revenues uh, does have a bit of an impact when we sit down for the, for the, you know, corporate plan um, uh, process or or, or uh, uh, potential future tax increases and so on and so forth. So. Um, in, in, yeah, again, in relation to this particular uh, uh, graphic, um, I would I would suggest that uh, you mean 110 is probably a little bit low. I think these are mostly, if not entirely, made up of uh, single and doubles. I think the 160 last year had a couple multi-unit in it, or at least one multi-unit of 80. I think I believe was in there last year. So. Um, I think, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm just going to stop there and see if I'm, you know, getting to the mark there or 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 not. And I would put it back to Councillor Laurie. Yep. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and, and thank you, Mr. Golden. And and I would I would say, you know, obviously looking say 2015 at 381 dwelling units. Obviously, that probably includes uh, some higher levels of higher density and those type of things. And and this is where I go similar to to what we just heard in the presentation that we had prior. Uh, when we look at, you know, the varying expressions of desires of what people want to see in the town of Stony Plain and what we, what people uh, expect, I guess, to see in development to the town of Stony Plain, I think this just kind of highlights some of the problem that you can have if you don't have a wide variety of options available. Uh, you know, it's it's great to have bungalows, and like I said, there definitely are people who will buy bungalows, but if all you have is bungalows. Uh, you're not going to see much in the way of growth. And unfortunately, when you don't see growth, as as we heard from the town manager there, that puts you in a predicament because with inflation and with the, the ever-changing markets that we face, we do need to have a certain amount of growth. We do need to have a certain percentage of growth, even just to stay status quo. And as we look forward and we look at some of the projects we have on the table and what we want to achieve, things like recreation centers and all of those type of things, again, you know, growth is a paramount aspect to those um, without putting a, an unnecessarily large burden on our already existing tax base, as well as hitting them with repeated increases year over year over year because we have not had appropriate and sustainable growth uh, to maintain that level of status quo. So uh, I, I do think the town manager kind of hit some of the points that I was inquiring about. Um, as the, if, if I can analyze it a little bit, it does sound like you know, the town manager is recognizing that in order to stay that status quo, we would need to see some higher numbers than what we've seen. And uh, I think that's a very important message for council to hear. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Laurie. Uh, going around the table, Councillor Pletchko. 
Uh, yes. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, uh, through to administration. Uh, either I can't read or it just wasn't in this report. Where in the report does it tell us what is the percentage of build out in each one of the subdivisions that we have currently on? So I'm just wondering, like West Terra, uh, how much land is there still there that's developable? How much land? Um, through your worship to uh, Councillor Plechko, in terms of the report that was just provided to council, that specific information is not in there. However, we do do monthly statistics that are, are posted on the website, and they actually do show the number of lots still available in each, in each neighborhood. So that would be one way to look at that information, is to look at the monthly statistics. So it shows lots, but what I'm getting at is how much of the land is still developable? So we, we know that West Terra, and I'll just use numbers, no, no specifics, but let's say there's 20 lots left in West Terra. But how much of that West Terra that is still developable has the potential for 200 lots? Like, you get what I'm getting at? Uh, through your worship to Council Pratico, I, I do understand that part. Um, it's very difficult to do that in the sense that even though an area has like an area structure plan that shows you know, a percentage of the area, often details such as, you know, park dedication, MR, for example, environmental reserve, those areas are not necessarily defined until we get to the subdivision level. So this is one of the reasons why we kind of have staging. Over time, as areas come online, we will define all those areas. The other the factor I guess I'll throw in there is that it's up to a developer to propose the size of lots. So if the lots are a little bit more narrow, for example, or a little bit wider, uh, if they're done as a comprehensive site plan, like a medium density or high density site, that'll vastly change how many lots, for example, we could have come online. Even just some of the examples that I know UDI showed earlier today, you know, you can get 7% more just by a small change in terms of lot widths, in terms of understanding how many lots could come online within the same area itself. Okay, so then I'm going to expand a little bit on that question because you kind of went to where I was headed. So with the developers today that we have in our community, what prevents them from coming to us with a plan to develop a portion of that subdivision with zero lot lines, smaller lot lines, um, similar to what we just seen here, houses that still have title but are joined together. Is there anything that prevents them from doing that? Is there a hindrance that we have that we could remove from our planning that would help them to be able to come with some suggestions or at least open the dialogue so that planning may have that conversation a little bit with council to move that forward? Through your worship to Councillor Plechko, the difficulty is that your area structure plan, which is typically where council gets directly involved, or your, your zoning level, the area structure plan level is just going to define your approximate, you know, is it high density, low density, residential, medium density, kind of throwing that terms around, those terms around. When we get to the rezoning, I guess that's where you're defining it better, and specifically in terms of the regulations within each district really defines the potential, I guess, lot layouts that are possible, say, when we get to the subdivision level. So is there something, again, is there something in that that prevents the developer from coming forward with that type of project? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I'm going to maybe jump in a bit here and maybe see if I can uh, um, <coughs> provide a bit of a comment on that one. So. Um, and, I, and I guess because part of the way uh, the dialogue has been this evening and the presenters that we did have. So if, uh, and I, uh, you know, if you think back to the housing strategy that was just presented relatively recently through to the presentation tonight even from uh, UDI, and I would say through to uh, a couple weeks from now, I believe uh, there will be some land use bylaw changes coming in, which will... Um, which will be brought to council um, in alignment with the housing strategy recommendations, which were to 
uh, examine or look at smaller lot sizes, so on and so forth, and spoke to some of the items from UDI tonight. Um, uh, you know, without, I, I would assume that will probably be a bit more of a technical conversation. But if I'm hearing the question, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we are tracking from that housing strategy through that conversation tonight to the land use bylaw, which um, one of the quick answers is, uh, yes, some of that just simply is not allowed at this point in our zoning bylaws. Uh, much of it is, but some of it isn't. So those are coming in. I'm just going to ask one of the staff to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe those are coming in the next couple of weeks as part of land use bylaw changes. One week, I'm being told. So I'll stop there and in case the GM or the manager want to jump in, but I, I just took that as a, what I believe maybe the question was going towards. So, yeah, Thank you. I guess I could just elaborate a little bit to say things like secondary suites, we already have those. Um, we're actually fairly flexible compared to some jurisdictions on those. Um, other ones like the zero lot lines, again, we don't have that. I think um, the UDI representative indicated that. So that's one area that will be proposed in the coming week, um, along with a few others. You know, in terms of the narrow, it's how narrow, I guess. So we've got some. Um, but we're not as narrow as other municipalities. And then some of those more innovative forms, um, the park amenity, I believe, ones. Uh, for example, we've got some, some changes that might allow close to or something towards that effect. Um, but again, more details next week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Hanser? Well, I'm very glad to hear that. So if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, Developers, I'm just going to use Qualico because we heard from them, own a fairly large amount of land yet that has not yet been identified how many lots are going to be there because they haven't come to planning to say we'd like to develop these next, this next phase and in that phase we'd like to have this amount of duplexes, this amount of small lot single family, this, this amount of a larger lot single family and we'd like to have a small, a multi multi-family dwelling like an apartment building. Is it possible that planning and infrastructure can say to that developer when they come for the next piece to be developed, council has an appetite to see some diversity in the housing because we're going to be passing a housing strategy here. Um, would you come back to us with something along these lines and give them the opportunity? Because the way it is right now, if an area structure plan and the municipal development plan has been put in place for an area, and we can't look at changing or suggesting to the developer that it change, then we're going to be tied up for years without being able to implement any changes. But if we if we come out of this whole process that a lot of work has gone into on the housing strategy and we say we really want to see some of this begun now, really soon, like in this year's development process and a permit approval process, that could be moved up. But I think it would have to take a suggestion from planning and infrastructure because Developers like Qualico aren't used to building that, even though we heard from one of their representatives tonight. They haven't, they haven't done that in Stony Plain before. It hasn't been quote unquote allowed, as he said in the presentation. So could that happen, Mr. Dibble, if, if, uh, if they come back now and they want to develop, and it doesn't have to be just Qualico, it could be anybody. But my understanding is Qualico owns a huge amount of farms over by the high school and it would be wise for us to think about how we can encourage reshaping things there a bit. Some of the neighborhoods around won't like that happening in their backyard but that's where I think council has to sort of suck it up and, and step forward in some sense of vision and courage to make some changes happen. Thank you for the comments, Councillor Hanser. There was a question in there. Is that uh, something were, that could Your happen? Worship, uh, 
through you to Council Hans Hansard. Uh, so the, uh, as the town manager mentioned, the housing strategy was our conduit to the development community and as well as the, the community at large for potential changes. And so we we brought that to council, and it's been accepted for information. So the next stage would be, that, you know, we've heard from the development community. These are some of the options. These are some of the trends. Okay. What works for for Stony Plain? Starting next week, one week from today, the, the LUB will come for first reading, and it has some of these changes. And we would propose to put them on the table, have a public hearing, and have further uh, discussions and council debate on what is appropriate for the town. And that would happen starting next week, and then through to April when a decision would be made, do we want these or not, what is appropriate for the town, and then the development community has, has told us that they have stages that they are in the design stage now, and, and if some of these things were enabled, they would change their plans and, and revise their plans to, to utilize some of these things. So it, it, it would happen as early as this, this year. Okay, very good. Just clarification. Does that mean we couldn't move on suggesting that a developer come to us with, an, with a request to do these things until we develop the new housing strategy? So is that the very first piece that has to happen? Or are we, are we able to sort of suggest, let's try it, and we'll put it in a public hearing and see if it lives or dies? Um, thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Council Hansard. So Council did accept the housing strategy. So you've already made the decision to accept that. So that is a direction. We accepted it for information. Correct. So now we're going to, now we're in implementation of the strategy, two of these items are coming forward okay. that you will debate and, and consider in, the, in basically the next six weeks. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hansard. Um, any other questions? Uh, I have just one uh, to administration in regards to the secondary suites, uh, which we currently already allow. Uh, I'm curious how we get that uh, message out to uh, residents. Well, I mean, obviously the developers uh, most likely are aware, um, but I'd be curious how uh, your average resident who might be interested in something like that would be uh, aware. to the deputy mayor. Um, <clears throat> honestly, the, the difficulty, I guess, is that we've already enabled it. So part of it might be additional education and messaging, perhaps. But honestly, I, I think the, the key thing that I know I've been aware of for the last five years is that we've actually been fairly progressive in terms of our regulations and our availability of secondary suites. I know just last year when we updated the LUB, we moved it from a discretionary use to a permitted use, which again further enabled that, reducing red tape, removing kind of some of the barriers that were there for those that were left. Um, and again, a lot of that came out of the fact that it was a discretionary use. We had some appeals over the first three, four years, and most of those appeals um, did not proceed. Um, they didn't go anywhere. They were able to still develop. So we kind of felt that the community was accepting of that, which is why we made the recommendation and council did accept that. So I'd say for secondary suites, uh, we're kind of on the forefront for allowing it. I would again offer just education might be the, uh, the only way that would maybe promote it more actively than it already is enabled by our, our current LUB. And thank you, I, I appreciate those comments. Uh, I would just, uh, um, it's not the first time I've had people who I tell, well, well we do this, and them being completely sort of, uh, caught off guard they don't they don't realize it and so it is quite a popular thing and, and you're right uh, we have been fairly aggressive in in our allowing it so uh, it might be something that we could do a better job just making some people aware okay uh with that i got to say my thing and so now we have to uh vote to accept it for information uh if i'm correct so i will call that vote now. Oh, thank you, Councillor Pletchko. Uh, Councillor Loins, can you make the motion? And also, it's a 2021 Annual Development Activity Report for information. Thank you. Now, we would go for further discussion. Uh, if there's any further discussion on the matter, I'm looking online. I don't see anybody putting their hands up, so we will now go to the question. All in favor? 
And I see we uh, lost Councillor uh, Mayor Choi, but we will go to Councillor Lori for a voice, a voice, a voice vote. In favor. Thank you. Uh, and that is carried. Uh, so there you go. Moving on. Uh, information items. We don't have any. Uh, so that moves us on to number seven, council discussion. Starting with Councillor Loins again. Uh, I just wanted to say that congratulations to all the finalists and the winners at the Chamber Awards. It is a very big thing for you all, and congratulations. As well as I wanted to have mentioned the Moosehide Walk that is taking place on February 10th, I believe it is. Um, this is the Moosehide Campaign Day to end violence against women and children. It will be taking place at the Shikawi Park at 12 noon. And that is Thursday, February 10th. Thank That's you. That's it. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Pletchko. If that's okay. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yes, that's very fine. No matter where you go. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to mention the same thing. Uh, we had several finalists, and it was an awesome evening. The Chamber put on an excellent gala awards. It was well attended, and the business community got out and enjoyed themselves for the first time in a long time. So thank you to the Chamber for that special evening. Uh, I do want to make mention to our Public Works Department. I think you guys are doing a phenomenal job with the ice in our community and trying to get the roads cleaned. I know it's a tiresome job, and we as councillors, I'm sure every one of us has had 400 people phone us about how bad the roads and streets and everything are. But I had the opportunity to help remove a little bit of ice here in town and it is astronomical. And it's not just like that here, but we remove ice in other communities and it's like that everywhere. So I'm hoping that uh, our residents can be a little more patient with uh, our public works department because I know you guys are doing all that you can to get it done. And uh, I thank you from my own personal self. I think it's a, a great job that you're doing and that uh, Public Works has gone out of their way. And administration, I'm sure, has been fielding lots of phone calls. So I thank you for each and every one of you for that tonight. Thank you, Councillor Pletchko. Um, we'll go to our online Councillor, uh, Councillor uh, Laurie. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, no, I just kind of echo what Councillor Pelechko said there. Uh, obviously, a reminder to residents that the town of Stony Plain is one of the only municipalities that I have known and seen and heard of that actually provides free salt sand mixture for their residents outside of the public works building. So for those who are battling the icy conditions, definitely that is a huge asset to have in our community, and I encourage them to use that. Uh, I would agree with Councillor Pelechko. Uh, I had to personally go out and buy a 20 pound crowbar to break the six to eight inches of ice up in front of my property and, and we take pride in how well we uh, we keep our property clear over the winter. So, you know, it's it's a formidable enemy and our public works crews are doing all that they can and uh, just encourage people when they are in your neighborhoods, please make sure your vehicles are moved so that uh, as good of a job curb to curb can be done. And once they are done, definitely take the time to try and help clear any little bit that remains so the catch basins are accessible for all that water. So, again, kudos to the crews that are out there and to the residents who are pitching in their part as well. And I look forward to the continued warm weather this week, hopefully helping us out a little bit with that as well. Thank you, Councillor Laurie. Um, I, too, am looking forward to warm weather next week or the rest of the week. Um, moving over to my left, uh, Councillor Hanser, do, do you have... Mayor. Well, I want to say uh, th thank you so much uh, to all the recipients for, for doing what they do so well of our, of our awards for the chamber, uh, chamber award system. But I do want to just call out and give kudos to uh, Victor Moros, who took a simple live auction and turned it into a spectacular show and actually raised an outstanding amount of money off of centerpieces uh, from the table. So uh, I knew he was an auctioneer from years ago, but I think I just so totally d developed a new appreciation of him. I, although I hear he doesn't want more auction jobs, but he did such a good job, and it was a wonderful evening. 
uh, hopefully in years to come, we'll be able to get back to regular numbers that we used to see at that event so more people can enjoy being there. I also want to give kudos to Public Works, and I won't elaborate anymore, except to say the residents in the town have really shown what they're made of because they step up and help their neighbors, and if somebody's out chipping ice, the, you end up with a community gathering happening there, and they're laughing and carrying on and helping each other to chip through the ice. So it's good to see that uh, neighbor helping neighbor taking place all over the town, and uh, just really appreciate the, our residents and their can-do attitude and the way they uh, don't get buckled under with the enormous task with the ice. Thank you, Councillor Hansard. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I had a little preamble written uh, to say the same has been shared, I think, across the board uh, with thanks and, and gratitude for our Public Works uh, teams and our snow removal crews. Uh, the piece that I would add is I've had uh, a number of residents uh, comment uh, on their appreciation um, and their understanding of, of how challenging the year has been. Um, and so that thanks not only comes from, you know, council, but from uh, the community as well. Um, being the new guy, and I can only play that so long, but uh, I'm going to play it tonight uh, one more time. But um, I do have a couple questions uh, and just things that uh, uh, I don't know the answers to. Um, and so through uh, you, Deputy Mayor, to our CAO and planning of infrastructure, I know we have a neighborhood rotation um, in terms of a schedule and those sorts of things, but I'm not um, confident in how that works in terms of, you know, who moves up, who moves down, and when that happens. Um, and I'm hoping someone can clarify that for me. Uh, Your Worship, through you to Council Anderson. So there is, there is a rotation. In, in general, we have a, what I would call groupings of subdivisions so that uh, when we go into, into an area, we do, you know, three or four at, the, at a time and before we move on to a different area. So in, in, uh, in general, there, there are uh, lists of, we have a list of, tw of 20 subdivisions, two groups of 10, and because we typically have two crews. And uh, so if you're, at, if you're in the top grouping this year, then uh, next year you would move to the bottom and then the, the other people at the bottom would move up a grouping. So it's, it's not as simple as, you know, you know the, the mathematics doesn't quite always work. The other complicating factor is the uh, uh, waste disposal schedule sometimes conflicts with the, the day that you might be uh, getting service. So if like, we can't go through, the, through there when there's a uh, garbage in the way, et cetera. So, but in general, there is a, it would take about uh, two to three years, depending on the, on the circumstance, to get from the bottom to the top. Awesome, thank you for that. And then just uh, a quick follow-up. Uh, it sounds like I've got some fellow council members that have been out chipping ice as well. And I've had the opportunity to do that with a number of residents over the last few weeks and, and had some great conversation. Um, but the question has come up, what can residents do or who do they contact um, if they have a catch basin that's completely ice over that they haven't been able to access? Uh, Your Worship, through you to Councillor Anderson. So what they can do is phone the Public Works uh, Department and the uh, work order will be created to uh, thaw a particular uh, area or even go out and chip some of the ice if it's simply a matter of the water not getting to the, to the spot. Uh, for instance, for today we had uh, one crew out. Tomorrow there will be more than one crew. We are looking at contracting on another crew just to keep ahead of the pooling water. I guess, I guess the... Uh, opportunity of the warm temperatures this week is, is uh, advantageous to us to uh, maybe clear away some of this uh, ice conditions because there may still be, according to the ground dog, and there still be six more weeks of winter. So we'll, uh, <laughs> we would like to, we may have to live with this ice for six more weeks unless it melts in the next week and, and significantly melts. So that's, that's one thing we are, we are attempting to do is uh, uh, get ahead on the uh, catch basin draining of, of the water that's sitting in pooling in various locations. So the best best thing to do is, is to call Public Works and uh, bring it to their attention that there's a large pond of water in a certain location that, you know, the resident cannot deal with or need some help dealing with. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much. That's it. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. And with that, uh, I would just like to mention the, uh, the names of some of our award winners. So, um, 
at the Chamber Awards, we had Al Dixon win the uh, Award of Creative Excellence, as well as uh, West Parkland Gas Co-op won the Ambassador of Action Award, and I believe uh, the town uh, Facebook and social media feeds have, have put a post out uh, so you can see them with their nice, lovely awards. And with that, I think we have gotten to the end, and I get to adjourn the meeting. I'm looking around. 